So without further ado, we start the meeting. I give the floor to the president who will start the meeting. Mr. President. Okay. As we have uh, challenges with um, the president, I think, I think maybe we could uh, go immediately with the report of the treasurer and then we hand it over to the president. Meanwhile, we will try to, to connect. Um, I wonder if the treasurer is connected and is ready to deliver his report. Although we should approve the agenda first, but uh, I think we have to improvise. I can see the treasurer trying to find. <laughs> I apologize to everyone. It's the first time that we use Zoom for this kind of um, event and we're doing it from the Hofburg. So everything is new to us. And, um, Hello. Okay. Um, Peter. I'm, I'm also in parliament. Very good. So uh, I just need to find a place where I can uh, uh, give you my report. Are you ready? Ready to go, okay. Then I give you the floor. Thank you. Dear President, dear colleagues, my full and very detailed report has been handed out. So I'll be very brief in my presentation. In accordance with our rules, you will find my report in the audited accounts of the assembly for the past financial year. I have once again, good news. The report of our external independent professional auditor gives us a very positive assessment of our financial management for the past year. Thank you to all of you and your parliaments for the support. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected our work, but we are finally healthy, financially healthy. The assembly's current budget reflects the amount saved are used in an extra contribution from the OSCE PA International Secretariat to our budget. This has considerably reduced the amounts of all delegations annual contributions. This is a very exceptional measure, which we will be applying for the second year in a row. But we will get back to this in April, when I will propose next year's budget to the Bureau as usual. However, from the next year budget cycle, we will have to return to standard procedures. Keeping this in mind, I will start to prepare my proposal for the assembly's budget for the next financial year, together with the secretary general and his very good staff in the coming weeks. I can promise you that the budget for the next financial year will ensure that the assembly continues to function in a very efficient way. I look forward to discuss the draft budget with the Bureau in April, as mentioned. When I have received the Bureau's feedback and approval, I will circulate the draft budget to all of you in the standing committee. And I very much welcome your comments, suggestions, and your input. We must continue our work together. Our full independence from the OSCE structure makes us flexible in a, in a reliable institution. The OSCE PA is a long way from the budget problems the OSCE governmental side has faced every year. Let me conclude by stressing that it is my ob objective and also an objective of the secret that the management of our budget reflects the efforts of all our parliaments to reduce expenses whenever we use taxpayers' money. I will be happy to receive your comments and answer all your questions. And I'm very open for your feedback. To save time in our meeting, I invite you to send, you, uh, send me your questions and I will comment it in writing. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Treasurer, dear Peter. And now is the president ready to start the meeting? Mr. President? Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. President, do you hear us?
think the president is trying to connect through the phone to us. So just bear in mind that it takes a few minutes. Mr. President, if you hear us, we're waiting for you. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Mr. President. Now we hear you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Very good. Many apologies. I, I don't know what's wrong with it, but the sign on the test. But anyway, you can hear me. You can see me, I take it. Yes. I can't hear you now. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Mr. President. It's perfect. You Go can ahead. hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Now we got ourselves organized. Well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for being so patient, but I've had some difficulties, as you gathered, in making contact uh, this afternoon. I could see you all, but I couldn't hear anything. I understand you couldn't hear me. Um, can I ask the Secretary General whether he has already advised you of the technicality? Uh, yes, I have, and we've actually already had the treasurer deliver his report, but we haven't started uh, with the, the adoption of the agenda, so you can start uh, from... All right, okay, okay. Well, colleagues, thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. And the first item on the agenda is indeed the adoption of the... Uh, adoption of this... I, is it agreed that the agenda be adopted? Agreed. The agenda, the agenda is adopted. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I would ask all uh, participants this afternoon um, to uh, take account of the timetabling, uh, which is on the draft uh, on the draft agenda. Um, this would be enable us to uh, get through this afternoon's meeting. Um, can I say? that you should sign up in advance to ask a question or participate in any open debate during our joint session tomorrow. And that list will close two hours before the start of the session. Um, I need to also sign up to uh, speak for the various committee meetings um, and instructions on to do that, how to do that are all in the procedural folder. Uh, um, document which is available in the electronic um, having said that uh, we can now proceed and perhaps we can re address my report uh, which is on the agenda as item number three uh, this report has been related and I hope that you will forgive me if I don't read it out, but I, since it's been in your hands, I don't see the necessity for that. But I would nevertheless uh, just make a few introductory comments and highlight some particular points in that report. Um, as most of you will know, I took over the uh, presidency of the assembly uh, from uh, so, Saratelli on the 11th of uh, December. Uh, his uh, failure to have a seat in the uh, new Georgian parliament. And uh, I would, again, as I have on other occasions, just want to put on record our appreciation for uh, President Saratelli's work on behalf of uh, the Assembly. And there has you will have in your set of general documents 
a report which has been prepared by uh, former President Sherry, um setting out uh, all his initiatives and journeys on our behalf during the whole of his presidency. And it is uh, a really um, uh, amazing um, set of activities on our, on our behalf. So I also want to say thank you very much to members and delegations for their kind words of encouragement um, to me. When I took over as president, I made it clear that I shall not run as the president um, if in a following our annual meeting. Uh, and uh, come July, there will be a new president and a new renewed bureau. I will do my best in what uh, time I have to make sure that the assembly remains in good order, um, but without making any commitments uh, that rights should rightly belong to the new president and the new bureau. Um, you'll all be aware that COVID-19 has uh, restricted our uh, activities, and uh, that has led to a number of uh, meetings uh, which uh, we have held online. And I particularly draw your attention to the uh, paragraph in my report dealing with our Bureau meeting of 2nd December, where the Bureau endorsed a set of provisional emergency rules in the unfortunate event that we were unable to gather in Bucharest. Now, it is becoming clear, and we may address this further later on in uh, the meeting, that uh, despite the best efforts of our Romanian colleagues, it will not be possible to have the uh, or normal annual meeting in uh, Bucharest due to the, the regard which they have to have over safety safe working um, in the light of COVID-19. Therefore, the item on our agenda this afternoon, uh, which deals, uh, item number six, uh, which deals with the adoption of emergency rules in the event of there not being an annual meeting, uh, is of critical importance. And I hope that uh, having considered them carefully, um, the Standing Committee will uh, feel able to adopt uh, those provisions, which, unless they are adopted, means that we cannot renew the offices of the Assembly or safely continue with our work. I think so far as uh, the rest of my report is concerned, it is, it is clear uh, I managed to pick up the uh, the addressing the Permanent Council on the 21st of uh, January, and that was uh, shortly after the US Capitol, and I expressed the concerns that we had all expressed uh, at various times over those those events, and the uh, worry of the public trust in documents and uh, institutions. Um, I have indicated that because of the circumstances in which we're working, it's my intention to call more frequently on Bureau meetings of the Bureau to take advice from colleagues and ensure that our positions are discussed and adopted in a consensual manner. We've also taken the opportunity of uh, establishing contact with the new OSC executive officers. On the 26th of January, we hosted the new Secretary General um, uh, Helga Schmidt, and uh, I hope that we will be able to host um, the other new office holders, the direct democratic institutions and human rights, um, uh, Mr. Matteo Matachi, the new representative on the freedom of the media, uh, Teresa Ribeiro, and the High Commissioner for National uh, Minorities, um, Ambassador Afghan. Uh, I beg your pardon, Abdrak Manoff. Um, we will want to continue to exploit our particular role, uh, creating interest um, in the OSC itself and our government. And of course, uh, part and parcel of that is the call for action, which was launched by my predecessor at the OSC Ministerial Council in December. 
Um, that was followed by a round table meeting uh, in January. Uh, the call for action was endorsed uh, by uh, the uh, of the OSC institutions and the Parliamentary Assembly, and our own bureau has added to the endorsement of the current political leadership of the Assembly. Uh, lastly, can I say that none of this would have been possible um, in this very difficult year uh, without the work of the International Secretariat under the leadership of uh, the Secretary General, Roberto Montella, and uh, I, he has done a great deal in enhancing the reputation of the Parliamentary Assembly within the OSCE family. And so uh, whilst nothing is certain as yet, I would thank all of you for your assistance and engagement in our work, and I look forward to working with you during this winter meeting, and hopefully I will be able to communicate with you on time and not hold you up as I did this afternoon. And in the coming months, I look forward to meeting our common challenges uh, with international dialogue and strong multilateral cooperation. Now, I propose that we regroup remarks or questions on the next three agenda items, um, uh, the, namely that of the Treasurer, which apparently you have had, and the report of the Secretary General, uh, when uh, Roberto has uh, completed his uh, remarks. Hello? Roberto? I now, in that case, move to I to the Secretary General, Mr. Roberto Montella. Thank you very much. President, and thank you for the, your kind words. A year ago, we were in this room and the room was uh, pretty packed and full. Uh, now it's a bit sad to see the room totally empty. I'm speaking here in front of a set of empty chairs uh, with uh, some colleagues from the Vienna Liaison Office. But we have a member here from the Austrian delegation, uh, Reynold Lopatka, the head of our uh, Terrorism Committee and the Special Representative on Central Asia. So at least one member is present being in Austria. Thank you very much, Reynaldo Pataka, for being with us. Um, the pandemic, COVID pandemic, of course, has affected us all. And uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity as this is uh, basically with this meeting, we conclude one year, a full cycle of meetings that we would not been able to have uh, in person. I hope uh, it concludes that cycle, but I'm afraid uh, we'll have um, more bad news later on in my address. But um, uh, in this year, uh, I would like to express solidarity to the colleagues who have been affected by the COVID. There's been five uh, of uh, the International Secretariat staff who have been uh, attached by this. Of course, uh, we know of some members, so full solidarity to the members, and also full solidarity to the OSC colleagues of the executive structures. Uh, there have been 532 cases. This is the last figures that we received today. And uh, unfortunately, also one colleague uh, died uh, of uh, the COVID pandemic uh, in the OSC uh, entire organization, which has around uh, 3,500 uh, people. So 532 were affected by that. So full solidarity to them. Uh, one lessons we've learned during this year is that, uh, and it's the obvious one, is that uh, we're all interconnected. Uh, we cannot deal with the issues that we have, with the challenges that we have by dealing with them on a purely national uh, agenda. We can see it uh, with uh, the issues of vaccines. We can see it also with the issues of uh, if you have one country which is totally safe, uh, of course, if you are surrounded by other countries who have not been vaccinated, you still are affected by the pandemic. So uh, the lesson that we draw is that we have to uh, strengthen the multilateral uh, system that we have. We have to treasure the international organizations that we have, and we have to try to strengthen them. Um, I uh, um, mentioned at the last bureau meeting uh, that uh, a sentence that really struck me was that the real virus is uh, probably not the uh, COVID-19, but it's uh, the virus called selfishness indifference. If we approach the challenges that we have with selfishness, but thinking uh, only inward looking, I think we will have difficulties in dealing with the challenge that we have ahead. And these are the challenges of health, but also the challenges of climate change, the challenges of fighting uh, corruption, of fighting uh, organized crime, of fighting terrorism, uh, of uh, dealing with the movement of people, all these uh, challenges that we have in the international agenda are agenda uh, items that require 
a, a multilateral approach uh, require cooperation, which is what we try to do here. Unfortunately, in the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, we try to do this uh, um, exercise of cooperating with each other when we meet each other, when we talk to each other, when we, besides the official meeting, also meet in uh, social occasions. Uh, we have not been able to do this for the last year, and uh, we will try to resume this as soon as possible. But I must say I've been extremely proud of what the OSC Parliamentary Assembly has managed to do in the last year. I think we reacted very quickly. We uh, were also creative in introducing a new way of working. I will not list uh, the entire set of meetings that we've had online, but if you see in the written report, which I referred to and I've addressed, in the last pages, you will find three full pages uh, here of activities that have been held in this last year, which is quite impressive, I must say, if you think of all the issues that have been discussed. And this is all thanks to you. And so I really thank all the members that have participated and I thank all the staff that have been involved into participating in this, uh, in this uh, exercise. Um, we've also tried to use our parliamentary diplomatic channels to deal with some of the hot issues we have within the OSC family. I recall uh, the uh, activities that we've done, especially in Belarus, trying to put together the uh, opposition and the uh, authorities in Minsk. We've had actually a moment when the head of the Belarus delegation spoke to Ms. Tikhanovskaya in a web call. These are little things that we can contribute with, uh, with our uh, small means that we have, as we do not have possibilities to meet in person. But I'm very proud of what has been done by the Secretariat. We've had actually some activities in person, and I must say, uh, these were quite impressive in the way that we have managed to organize them almost uh, as we normally do. Uh, we had elections in Montenegro, in uh, Georgia, in the United States, with uh, many members involved. We had two elections on the 10th of January in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, and I thank also here uh, all those who have uh, led these missions, uh, Reynold Lopatka is here, but uh, also all those, Gary Eriksson, uh, Margarita Sederfeld, uh, Michael Link, uh, all of those who have had a leadership position in these uh, elections. Um, we are planning two election observation missions in Bulgaria on the 4th of April and uh, in Albania on the 25th of April and uh, um, preparations for these two missions are all. As we are in Vienna, uh, at quarters of the OSC uh, institutions, I would like also to take the opportunity to thank the Albanian chairmanship uh, who led the organization last year, and uh, of course, uh, to uh, welcome the Swedish uh, new uh, leadership, uh, but uh, to thank the Albanian chairmanship to manage to deliver to us uh, four new heads of institutions. Uh, We've uh, uh, had for six months a situation with the OSC with, uh, without uh, leadership in the four autonomous uh, bodies and in the secretariat. Now we have uh, four leaders, two women, two men, some of them are well known to us, who are leading these institutions. And I think the OSC is much stronger with, uh, with them on top. Um, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, uh, during this uh, period of uh, challenges that the OSC had, uh, triggered an activity that you, Mr. President, have referred to, the OSC Call for Action, or uh, if we look into the future, the Helsinki Plus 50 uh, project. Here, I would like to thank all the leaders, all the members of the Bureau for taking uh, this initiative, for uh, asking us to uh, put uh, some uh, ideas uh, on the plate. And I would like to thank all the uh, former leaders of the OSC, former chairman in office, former presidents, former generals, heads of institutions, who have uh, signed onto a document that was submitted to them that uh, is now the first uh, step or a set of activities that uh, under the leadership also of Ambassador Zanier, who has joined uh, us as a consultant to guide us uh, through this process, uh, leading us to uh, Helsinki Plus 50, a project which aims at trying to um, address the main challenges that I see in the OSC, which is the lack of political attention by the political leadership uh, in capitals. And we will address um, a number of issues that we think are um, 
hot issues or problematic issues within the functioning of this organization because we treasure the organization. I think this organization does a lot of good work in the field, in the headquarters, in the institutions. And I think it's a very well known secret, uh, but uh, among those who work in the organization, but it's not very much well known in capitals, in the political leadership. And so I think our effort is also to try to bring more attention at the capital levels to the organization. Um, I would like to thank uh, our hosts, uh, Austria, uh, for hosting a, a Vienna liaison office here. Uh, we are in the process of changing offices. In the coming months, we will uh, move our liaison office in Vienna into new headquarters. I've just had a meeting with the Secretary General of the uh, Foreign Ministry of Austria, who has uh, kindly offered the Austrian support, also financial support uh, for part of the costs of these new premises. I would like to thank Denmark for hosting us in Copenhagen, our HQ in Copenhagen, and also to thank uh, Italy and Germany for uh, contributing to our budget uh, by paying for some of the staff that we have on uh, board. Uh, we've had a uh, new uh, staff joining us, uh, a new colleague, uh, Daria from the Russian Federation has just joined our Vienna liaison office uh, starting this week. Um, the president has hinted at some of the challenges that we have now. I will not uh, uh, want to have all the discussion about the annual session uh, right now because we will have also our Romanian colleague uh, speaking to us. But what we know for a fact is that the annual session as we were hoping uh, would happen in person, it's not going to be the case. Uh, we will not have the annual session, unfortunately, fully uh, fledged as we've known it in person. So. We know by uh, this moment already that uh, uh, the um, election of officers, that's something that interests many of you, will happen virtually. So we have already been in contact with the Spanish company. And in the coming weeks, we will meet with the Bureau also to uh, fine tune the technicalities of this. But uh, unfortunately, the annual session will not happen in person. There are discussions within the Secretariat on what could be the alternatives. I will leave it to the um, Romanian colleagues to give some ideas and then we can discuss about this. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Of course, there will be some questions I'm ready to answer, but uh, I just want to, to say that, uh, well, although it's, um, we say in Latin, uh, mala tempora currunt, it's, uh, it's a hard times, uh, you can see it uh, from the tone also of my voice uh, that uh, I'm not very happy with uh, the current situation, but I can see some uh, light at the end of the tunnel, and as you know, I'm uh, always an optimist, so I hope the best is yet to come for all of us, and I look forward to seeing you all in person. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I'm ready for questions uh, on the three agenda items that we've already had. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Uh, for your uh, report, and uh, as I indicated, uh, the floor is now open to members who wish to raise any questions on uh, the three reports uh, that you've had so far, um, mine and the Secretary General and the Treasurer. So please, may I hear from... Uh... Yes, Mr. President, so I have a list of speakers, and the first speaker is Margareta Sederfeld. Thank you thank very you. much, Mr. Record. Chair. Uh, I would first like to say uh, thank you, Mr. President, for your efforts uh, to lead the OSCE PA during this uh, period, and also thank you very much for your leadership. I would like to start to say thank you to our former president, Mr. George Seretelli, who is not with us today as he is not the parliamentarian any longer, but I would like to have just expressed that he has been a long-standing member of our uh, of the parliamentary assembly and he have as well been uh, in the leadership position for several years and uh, i think we have uh, should be very grateful for his efforts to lead the organization uh, i have one question about the summer meeting and it's uh, if I understood you right, Mr. Secretary General, will the meeting be held in, uh, on the web? Of course, because of the uh, COVID. But uh, is it possible to have it mixed in some way? I ask this because uh, PASA have held meetings in persons, and I know that there are others as well who have done this. Well, we are a different organization and the, the COVID is changing and the, the situation is changing, so it's not uh, proper to 
prefer. I just raised this question because uh, it's quite uh, interesting for all of us to start meet when it's possible. But I would also like to ask another question that you don't have to replay on immediately. It uh, might be clearer during the winter meeting. It's, it's very good that we as an assembly have managed to change our procedure to work and that we have managed to uphold all our activities during this very difficult period. But on the other hand, the COVID do also affect the issues we have to work with. It's a challenge, uh, quite a lot of issues. Uh, let me just mention the security issue. We could see that fake news are increasing. We could also see that the vaccination is something that uh, divide countries. We could see also the difficulties with the mutation and so on of the virus. And I wonder if this will have any kind of impact on the issues we work with, on how we address topics. Because as a security organization, it's of course of very high interest for all of us to be adequate, to be updated to the challenges we face today. And uh, I would be very glad to have some kind of comments on this. Maybe not now, if the time is short, maybe later. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you, Madam Sutherfeld. Um, we will take all the questions at the end, so we'll just move on with the, um, the questions now and we'll answer them all at the end. And now I give the floor to Vice President Pascal Alizar of France. De pouvoir vous euh, retrouver, même à distance et, et, et malgré les circonstances. Euh, je voudrais, comme vient de le faire Margaretha, avoir une pensée amicale pour Georges, ça a été lui, et tout ce qu'il a pu faire et, et, et nous apporter. Alors, remercier Victor aussi, qui prend les rênes dans des circonstances particulières et, et compliquées. Euh, et, et donc, euh, saluer le, le, le travail qu'il a mis en Nous avons subi, je crois, à notre aspect, euh, la, la triple peine euh, sur cette fin 2019, euh, 2020, pardon, et, et début 2021, avec euh, bah, la Covid, comme tout le monde, bien évidemment, avec aussi de, le, 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 le vide que nous avons connu de quelques mois euh, au niveau de l'OSCE versus le gouvernemental, mais aussi notre transition de, 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 de président. Euh, si je rappelle cela, c'est pour saluer euh, aussi euh, le travail et, et, et la continuité qui a été euh, assurée dans, dans nos travaux par Roberto et, et, et toute son équipe. Et, et vraiment, les, les, on le sait, il a, il a fait son enfin, propre rapport de, 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 de ses travaux, de ses, de ses travaux de ses collaborateurs. Je suis vraiment salué ça. Et saluer aussi euh, les relations que nous avons pu continuer à entretenir les uns avec les autres, certes de manière un peu désordonnée, mais les circonstances sont telles, mais qui font qu'aujourd'hui, on peut continuer à échanger, à... partager une idée qui nous ont été rappelées par notre secrétaire et viendrait euh, dans la presse pour trouver en ce qui nous concerne quelques éléments d'information et de réflexion sur la situation en médias et en société. Je en tout cas, je vous retrouver à cette occasion, même si l'ambiance viennoise peut nous manquer un peu. Merci. Ok. Merci, Pascal. And uh, I now give the floor to Mikita Potorayev from Ukraine, head of the Ukraine delegation. Mikita, you need to unmute. Uh, we cannot hear you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. very good. Everything is fine now. Uh, you read me well? Okay. 
So, Mr. President, distinguished colleagues, uh, sorry that I will take some of your time uh, to remind you about uh, well-known well -known, uh, worldwide facts. This is a second year we see an invisible security challenges uh, stemming from the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which affects all, all our societies. To overcome in, uh, with minimum losses uh, for our citizens, we urgently need all resources we have, we all have at our disposal and international solidarity. Ukraine stays among those countries which are particularly vulnerable to such crisis as coronavirus, as we remain a victim of external armed aggression. Seven years ago, the Russian armed aggression against Ukraine started, bringing numerous human losses, temporary occupation of the autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol and certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Despite numerous initiatives of Ukraine aimed at the peaceful resolution of the conflict, the Russian armed aggression is ongoing and current trend of the situation in the temporary occupied territories can be generally characterized as deterioration in all areas. In fact, the Russian occupied Crimea and parts of Donbass region transformed into a territory of lawlessness where human and civil rights and freedoms are violated, illegal passportization and forced imposition of Russian citizenship are being carried out, where violence, torture, persecution and suppression of any dissent became an everyday practice. We underline the need for enhanced international cooperation aimed at the deoccupation of Crimea, including through the implementation of Ukraine initiative uh, Crimean platform. I hope that uh, uh, a lot of uh, you already have heard about it. We stress the importance for the OCPA to keep high on its agenda the issue of addressing Russia's aggression against Ukraine and ensuring the implementation of the OCE principles and commitments. I have to stress that uh, unfortunately, uh, a Russian war against Ukraine uh, continues in all possible fronts. And uh, the steps that we had to provide as, for example, uh, sanctions against companies uh, of some of Ukrainian politicians uh, were aimed to stop Russian intervention, not only territorial, but also to our international sphere of security and political sphere of security. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Thank you very much. And thank you for sticking to the time. And I now give the floor to Oskar Shakirov from Kazakhstan. Спасибо, уважаемый господин председатель, дамы и господа. Несмотря на трудности, возникшие с пандемией коронавируса, в прошлом году мимо нас не прошли памятные даты. Это 45-я годовщина принятия Хельсинского заключительного акта. 30-летие принятия Парижской хартии, а также 10-летний юбилей Астанинского саммита ОБСЕ. Как вы помните, председательство Казахстана в ОБСЕ выпало на сложный период современной истории. Это политический кризис в Кыргызстане, критическая ситуация в Афганистане и решенность так называемых замороженных конфликтов. Однако, несмотря на все перипетии, нам удалось зафиксировать новую эпоху в истории организации, собрав после 11-летнего перерыва за одним столом глав государств и правительств и принятие похальную Астанинскую декларацию. 19 февраля этого года состоялась международная онлайн-конференция, посвященная этому событию, в которой принял участие генеральный секретарь парламентской ассамблеи Роберто Монтелла, за что мы выражаем ему нашу большую признательность. Уважаемые дамы и господа, мы благодарны албанскому председательству за плодотворную работу, проделанную в прошлом году, несмотря на сложности, с которыми оно сталкивалось в течение года из-за пандемии COVID-19, известного институционального кризиса в ОБСЕ. Основным итогом последнего заседания Совета министров иностранных дел ОБСЕ стало достижение консенсуса по назначению всех четырех глав институтов организации. Отрадно, что впервые государства-участники приняли решение с учетом сбалансированного географического представительства и гендерного баланса в руководстве исполнительных структур организации. Представитель Казахстана занял пост Верховного комиссара по делам национальных меньшинств ОБСЕ. Стоит отметить, что никогда ранее представители стран СНГ и Центральной Азии не были представлены в составе руководства организации. Мы надеемся, что принцип равного географического представительства также будет соблюден 
в ходе выборов на июльской ежегодной сессии. Пользуясь случаем, хочу поблагодарить парламентскую ассамблею за направление ограниченной миссии на парламентские выборы в Казахстане в январе этого года. В целом, выборы прошли организованно и эффективно, несмотря на пандемию коронавируса. Электоральная кампания прошла в условиях открытости и транспарентности. Отличительной особенностью прошедших выборов стало то, что они прошли по партийным спискам и в новых законодательных условиях. В 2020 году в рамках пакета президентских политических реформ либерализовано партийное законодательство. Законодатель закреплен институт парламентской оппозиции. Введена 30% квотов в партийных списках для женщин и молодежи до 29 лет с целью более активного их вовлечения в деятельность парламента и местных представительных органов власти. Открывая сессию обновленного состава парламента 15 января, президент Касамжамар Тукаев выдвинул новые инициативы – снизить порог для прохождения политических партий в Нижнюю палату парламента с 7 до 5 процентов, а также включить в избирательный бюллетень графу против всех. В заключение хочу поблагодарить генерального секретаря господина Роберта Мантелу и весь международный секретариат за э, обеспечение слаженной и эффективной работы Ассамблеи, несмотря на вызовы, связанные с пандемией коронавируса. Желаю всем участникам конструктивной и плодотворной работы в рамках зимней сессии. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you, Mr. Shakirov, and thank you also to the Library of the First President and the MFA for organizing the conference you referred to. That was a very timely conference because we need to revive the spirit of Astana and uh, the political attention that was there in 2010. Uh, I now give the floor to Reynold Opatka from Austria, who is here with us. <laughs> yeah, uh, dear Roberto, dear President, uh, dear colleagues, I have the privilege uh, to be here and hopefully uh, we have the chance Uh, meeting uh, next year again uh, here uh, in Vienna. Uh, I would uh, just want uh, to make short remarks to, to say thank you, uh, dear Roberto and, and your staff uh, in Copenhagen and, and also here in Vienna for your ongoing and professional support in challenging times like uh, we have it now because of, of COVID-19. Um, be engaged in, in different interparliamentary uh, groups for a long time. I would like to, really to, to stress that our parliamentary assembly uh, is performing uh, and in, in a very excellent way. And it, it's great work which is done here with a small team and, 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 and also a, a low budget, how I see it. Um, And uh, it was very important uh, for parliamentarians around the globe that we didn't stop with, with our work and that we also uh, used the chance to, to observe elections. And last time in Kyrgyzstan, I was really thankful having with me uh, an experienced colleague like uh, Andreas Baker. And it's also a signal uh, for, for our colleagues in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and, and the observers of the European uh, Union. And we are doing the same, and we continue to, with, with fighting uh, terrorism. Uh, and, and, and here we also encouraged colleagues from other parliamentary assemblies, uh, like uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean, uh, continuing in the, in the work uh, with us. And uh, before me, the colleague from Kazakhstan took the floor, and, 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 and he mentioned the big challenges in this region. And, and, and also I want to, to, to mention it, that for me as a special representative from Central Asia, it's very important uh, knowing uh, that, that we have uh, colleagues who are a strong support for us as politicians like Farima uh, Taftari. So what, what I want uh, to, to, to say is I'm optimistic uh, in, in a way Uh, that we can uh, continue in our work and can do it more and more in a hybrid way and, and, and hopefully next year here again in Vienna in person. Thank you very much for your support and your work. Thank you very much, Mr. Lopatka, dear Reynold, and thank you very much for the nice words that you spent for the staff of the Parliamentary Assembly. As you know, the staff is a small staff. It's a little growing now because we have a lot of activities ongoing, but uh, we do this with a lot of pleasure, a lot of enthusiasm, and uh, I must say also with a lot of professionality, and it's nice that it is recognized. And I give the floor to um, Vice President Azai Gulia from Azerbaijan. Azai, 
in that flock. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Roberto, dear president. If you allow me, I'd like to make a short remark, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary General, about your initiative, which I personally support very much, regarding the role of the OECPA in promoting sustainable peace and reconciliation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But before that, it, I deem it necessary to brief the Standing Committee about the trilateral statement on the, of the leaders of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the Russian Federation signed on November 10, 2020, resulting in the occupation of remaining three regions, thus putting an end to the occupation of Azerbaijan territories by Armenia. This statement was also remarkable for resolving almost three decades long armed conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan and creating ground for comprehensive peace agreement on the basis of mutual recognition of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and inviolability of the state borders. Dear colleagues, Azerbaijan is resolute to integrate its citizens of Armenian origin residing in conflict-affected territories into its political, social, economic space, providing them with the same rights and freedoms as other citizens under its constitution. The situation emerged after 44 day war and signing of two above mentioned trilateral statements make it imperative to abandon absolute ideas as well as think of approaches that are adequate to the reality on the ground. From this point of view, any attempt to artificially raise the issue of determining so-called status of Nakhone Karabakh will be assessed as support for separatism and violation of the sovereignty of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Dear Secretary General, for Azerbaijan, the year 2021 will be marked by active engagement with partners in the face of post-conflict rehabilitation and comprehensive development of the conflict-affected territories. To this end, take your initiative and proposal to turn the OECPA into the useful platform in the coming months for the crucial phase of the post-conflict stabilization and peace process between Armenia and Azerbaijan. On our part, as delegation of Azerbaijan to the OECPA, we are ready to play our role in materialization of all such initiatives in the name of regional peace and security and for the best interests of our peoples. In conclusion, I would like to express my sincere hope to see the same robust approach from our Armenian colleagues in this respect. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to Doris Barnett from Germany. Doris, you have the floor. Um, okay, thank, thank you, dear President, um, dear Secretary General, because, um, oh, just a second, I need to take off here my, the, the translation, because our President does, uh, does have no interpretation, I will do it in English. Um, thank you so much to you all for your good work. I just uh, reckon that you are uh, 36 people and doing a great work all together in, in uh, Copenhagen and uh, Vienna. However, uh, the treasurer told us about uh, the situation. Five countries, with well, um, except of one, with rather little fees, have not yet paid. And I please do urge all countries to do uh, to to fulfill their obligations, because being member of a budget committee here in Germany, so I know how urgent it is. But our treasurer was too cautious, I think. Uh, the call for action. Um, is uh, obviously a new thing. Is it, is it um, then a creation that will stay on for good? For instance, like the Leinsweiler uh, uh, seminar, and will we eventually meet then also in person? This is a question uh, that, and, and where would it be? Would it also have a, a fixed place? And do we find a, a someplace, uh, somebody, who is going to pay for it, or does it come out of the actual budget? And do we have enough um, space for that? And we also have two new uh, persons engaged. We have now two consultants in our um, on our list here in the with the organization. And I certainly hope that 
that find, we find that also in the budget. And um, I'm happy to see that our for former presidents and former vice presidents, that they form an organization of the um, former uh, people. And I'm very happy uh, to read that our secretary general told us that it's uh, totally voluntary and they organize themselves. It has nothing to do uh, with, the, with, the, with the organization as such. It is not in the budget because of course that would, would raise questions. And I'm very thankful to see a new policy in America that we are back to apost um, um, uh, or whatever that is in English and the Open, um, open Sky uh, Initiative, that it all comes back that gives us a much better um, a place and, and work to do and work with, with our colleagues in Russia and in America, because those security assets are very needed nowadays. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Barnett and Doris, for your kind words. And also you have in mind still the budget. So it's, it's uh, I will answer to the questions later on, but thank you very much for raising those questions. And now I give the floor to Vice President Kari Eriksson from Norway. Kari, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would like to commend you, Lord Bonus, on your clear and inclusive leadership as president of the OSCE PA. I'm grateful for the meetings you have initiated and for the good discussions in the Bureau. I would also like to thank you for the very important work on the rules you have been conducted for several years, and especially the provisional emergency rules, which we are discussing later today. I think it's important to get them on, uh, play, on place. I would also like to thank Secretary General and all his staff uh, for the report, uh, even if that's your report, you can see that it, it has been a, a big activity who has um, uh, included many of your staff members on, uh, in a very difficult time. So I just want to, to give my very big thanks to you, Roberto, and to your staff for having been so active in this uh, time and to uh, uh, we all strive to find a way to stay in contact in this uh, challenging time, but I think uh, we managed to do so in the, in the OSCE. I think that is very, very good. I also would like to, to commend the work regarding the election uh, process, election missions. And I will uh, just agree with you, Roberto, that I'm proud to be a part of it. And I'm very proud to have been in uh, USA and to, uh, to um, feel the enthusiasm and the strength of the politicians that were there and observing together with us. That was a very good experience. I would like to have some remark on the call for action, Helsinki 50 plus. I'm very pleased that the work is uh, anchored in the formal structures and that it will continue to be followed up under the leadership and the guidance of the Bureau as you are writing in your report. But in my opinion, I just want to ask you if, if it's possible to have a kind of paper to the, to the Bureau so that we can see the process and see especially have uh, the mandate and a summary of the proposals which we had in the in the brainstorming meeting with uh, regarding the, the work that uh, and the, um, the task that uh, this, uh, this group uh, should do. Uh, I think we have to focus on how we can support uh, the OSCE and we must make sure that we are all involved in the process. And the situation in the world, we have heard about it today, the conflicts, the pandemic, the gender issues, the economy, it challenged the parliaments and the OSCE to raise these questions at home in our own parliaments and in our own governments. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I will answer also these uh, questions about uh, election observation and call for action later on. And I give the floor to um, Oscar Mina, San Marino. Oscar, my la parola. Salve, Presidente, Secretario. È un piacere potersi rivedere in questa occasione e ammetto che 
fronte a una situazione così difficile potersi confrontare anche in modalità web, direi che è già una ottima iniziativa. Sono stato molto impressionato dal lavoro, tra l'altro, svolto sia dal segretario che dal mio presidente, che ha saluto cordialmente la sua disponibilità di aver voluto accettare questo incarico, magari anche temporaneo, in quanto credo che eh, seguire un po' i lavori in maniera così attiva di quello che stiamo facendo, soprattutto eh, anche noi piccoli stati, per cercare in qualche modo di supportare tutta l'attività dell'OSCE, dà un, eh, un grande senso di responsabilità. Io volevo mettere in evidenza alcuni aspetti che riguardano un po' gli stati, ad esempio il fatto di reperire le modalità eh, dei vaccini e l'OSCE in questo ambito credo che deve giocare un ruolo molto importante, molto attivo, anche perché stiamo parlando di sicurezza e cooperazione europea, quindi anche se eh, i piccoli stati come la Repubblica di San Marino ancora non ne fa parte, tuttavia eh, essendo uno Stato partecipe, quindi eh, questa grandissima organizzazione credo che sia un punto importante da cui dobbiamo prescindere. E la cooperazione in tal senso mh, mi auguro che possa essere maggiormente incisiva perché noi parliamo per una piccola realtà, le difficoltà sono enormi e non vogliamo essere comunque tenuti soddisfatti solo a dalle dimensioni. Noi siamo proattivi in OSCE e cercheremo in tutti i modi di darci, di dare la nostra, il nostro contributo nelle varie commissioni su tutti i temi che dovremo affrontare. Quindi io mi auguro ancora una volta, insomma, di potermi confrontare direttamente con il Presidente, Lord Bones e il Segretario Generale Roberto Montella, che è un nuovo saluto, per potermi confrontare e mettermi a disposizione anche da parte mia. Ringrazio infinitamente. Grazie mille Oscar, e ancora ci dispiace molto non essere riusciti a fare la sessione autunnale a San Marino, ma come ci siamo ripromessi speriamo che nei prossimi anni, quando la situazione anche dal punto di vista sanitario lo permetterà, possiamo riprendere quel discorso. And, uh, and now give the floor to the last speaker on the design item, uh, our colleague from Armenia, Mike Cognora. Mike Cognora. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to comment um, the speech of uh, Mr. Guliev, the representative of Azerbaijan, who touched upon the question of uh, 44 days war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, dear colleagues, on 27 September 2020, in flagrant violation of international law and principles of the Helsinki Final Act, namely the principles of refraining from the threat or use of force, peaceful settlement of disputes, equal rights and self-determination of peoples, not to mention the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, as well as ceasefire agreements of 1994 and 1995, Azerbaijan launched a well-prepared and planned aggression against the people of Artsakh which has led to the most serious crisis in the region since 1990s. Dear colleagues, on 9th of November, trilateral agreement was signed and hostilities stopped. According to the trilateral agreement, uh, prisoners of wars in both sides should be released immediately and returned to their countries. Unfortunately, till now, Azerbaijan keeps Armenian prisoners of wars and captives and other detainees in Azerbaijan, including civilians, including women. In recent weeks and months, we have witnessed inhuman treatment, cruel treatment against Armenian prisoners of war and captives in Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, from on the one hand, our Azerbaijani colleagues speak about peace and security in the region. And on the other hand, they are continuing to keep Armenian prisoners of war. They are violating their 
international obligations and their obligation according to the trilateral statement. This is this purely humanitarian issue. Azerbaijan tries to politicize and tries to use it as a leverage to make pressure on Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. According to the Geneva Convention, prisoners of war should be released and repatriated without delay after the cessation of active hostilities. Unfortunately, Azerbaijan, again, continues to keep Armenian prisoners of war. Azerbaijani authorities in a higher level continue their aggressive rhetoric. And by this, they show that they are not prepared for peace. They are not prepared for security in the region. My question to my Azerbaijani colleague is, if you are frank, it means that first of all, you should do the, the number one precondition, which is fixed in trilateral statement. You should implement your obligation, international obligations and obligations according to trilateral statement that signed your president, Ilham Aliyev. You should immediately release Armenian prisoners of war. If you are not going to do that, it is not frank to speak here about peace and security. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now, Mr. President, uh, if you want to wrap up some of these questions, I have some replies uh, to some of the points were raised, but maybe you want to go first. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. First of all, I have to apologize to uh, some of our speakers um, uh, because the interpretation via the phone uh, link doesn't work, and I'm still not linked to the uh, proper system. So I, I'm afraid I will have to leave those of our colleagues who were not speaking in English, who raised any points that might have been directed to me, ask you to tell me what they were, and I'll do my best to answer them, or I will leave you to answer them. I will, I'm particularly grateful to uh, Doris Barnett for uh, recognizing my language deficiency in speaking in English. And I'm, I'm really very, very grateful for that. Um, can I just to pick up on the points about the cause for action, which I think were mentioned um, certainly uh, by uh, Doris Barnett and by uh, Carrie Hendrickson. Um, well, last time we had a meeting uh, of the working group, I think it was suggested that we should have a piece of paper on A4 charting the way forward, um, in, at least in the hands of the Bureau or, and, and indeed the Standing Committee so that everybody knows what is going on. I think that would be very helpful. And of course, um, we are going to have a further uh, meeting, as I understand it, in, in March, um, to which leaders of the delegations have been uh, invited, but uh, members of the Bureau uh, if they're not members, uh, leaders of delegations will also also be invited. And I think that's particularly important so that we're very clear in our minds exactly what we're doing and where we're, di where we're actually going. Um, I know that you, uh, Secretary General, are anxious that we should be transparent about this. Uh, and I don't want a repeat of uh, Helsinki plus 40, uh, which um, I can only say the proceedings were somewhat opaque uh, as to how and when it went, uh, things were taken forward. So I do not want to, uh, want that to uh, happen again. Um, I really haven't got more to add unless there were particular um, questions directed towards me, uh, which by from speakers who I fear and apologize for the fact that I uh, couldn't uh, uh, receive the interpretation. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. We have to be uh, exercising the maximum transparency here. And I thank all of those who have raised questions. I'll take them in order. Um, the, for the summer meeting, uh, we will hear now from our um, Romanian colleagues. My understanding is that the annual session, as we know it, uh, with uh, 323 members plus staff coming to Bucharest, it's not going to happen. I want to be very clear with you. Uh, if that doesn't happen, 
provided that in the next agenda item you uh, pass these uh, uh, extraordinary measures to allow us to conduct an election electronically, uh, then the election of officers will take place electronically. That's, uh, um, that's going to be the reality for July. Uh, as far as having a meeting in person, this is something that we will be discussing. There might be some possibilities for that. We will be uh, uh, we will be in uh, a staff uh, in a bureau meeting sometimes next week or the following week and discuss with the bureau what could be the way ahead and some creative ways of actually having maybe a standing committee meeting in person uh, and enlarged. So we will study some possibilities, but uh, as it stands now, what we know for sure is that, and we will hear this from our Romanian colleagues, the annual session in full-fledged presence in Bucharest will not take place. Therefore, there has to be a electronic vote for the 20 officers uh, that are for renewal, actually 19, because the only person in this bureau who will for sure have a post in the next bureau is Azai Gulia, Vice President Gulia, whose mandate expires next year. And our current president who has announced he will not run for president, so he will be president emeritus next year. Um, in terms of the questions regarding the call for action, thank you very much for the support. As I said several times, this is a project of the Bureau. It was triggered by President Saratelli. It was endorsed by the Bureau in September and in December. It's under the leadership of the Bureau. We have to be absolutely full transparent about the activities that we have. I think my colleague uh, Frey has put in the chat now, uh, uh, she's about to put in the chat a link to our website where all the documents and papers that we've been produced are already there. And uh, the next meeting will be indeed on the 10th of March, where we will be discussing the issue of uh, the consensus, which is one of the issues that came up on the first meeting of uh, the call for action activity. It is not uh, a, a new Lanzweiler, as uh, Doris Barnett was asking. Uh, Lanzweiler is a very a special to us and very dear to us initiative, which hopefully will continue as soon as we can again meet in person. This is a, a different type of activity, uh, which uh, displays as we are now in this uh, uh, COVID times with uh, uh, online meetings, but there will be also other type of activities, which basically are all meant to ensure that we can provide to you members the tools for uh, influencing your ministries, influencing uh, the leadership, uh, the political leadership in your country in order to make the uh, organization more relevant uh, and more visible. But there will be a set of activities uh, where you will be uh, uh, absolutely leading, guiding and, and forging. So there's not going to be any opacity this time, especially because this is an activity which, and uh, Doris was asking the question, will indeed be part of the budget. The treasurer will present a budget in April where there will be a clear uh, uh, budget line, budget account uh, with resources dedicated to this activity. And therefore, uh, that's going to be a very clearly part of the activities that we are conducting. Um, thank you also for referring to the Association of Former Members. As I said clearly in the report, this is an association that uh, some uh, founding fathers, let's say the former presidents, have uh, triggered. It's something totally detached from the Parliamentary Assembly Secretariat. There will be no uh, resources uh, in that the International Secretariat has to devote to this activity. We look at this uh, association favorably because it's a possibility for former members who are no longer active in their parliament to still participate into some activities that this association will decide to uh, set in place. Uh, my idea uh, of this association is also to provide a place, a pool for former members to also remain active and maybe be engaged sometimes in some activities uh, where uh, they are participating in activities which are under the umbrella, let's say, of uh, uh, an agreement that we, they will probably have with us or with the ODIR when, and I mean, when sometimes they go to election observation. We've seen some members who are no longer members of the Parliamentary Assembly who have participated to some election observation being uh, guests of the host country. This is something that we do not like because we do not like that members who carry, of course, some experience by being former uh, uh, officers of this assembly participate in a private capacity as election observers, hosts uh, of, of a participating state. And therefore, 
uh, not uh, following a certain methodology. So this association could also become a filter so that it can send members if they wish uh, to go to observe elections with their own expenses and nothing to do with the OIC parliamentary assembly budget, of course, but uh, which will allow them to do this activity under the filter of the OSC methodology. And uh, one word about the OSC and the or DEAR methodology on election observation, I've always said this is kind of the uh, the uh, crown jewel in our family. This is something that we have forged together with the ODIR. I think this methodology needs to be preserved. We need to work very closely with the ODIR. Now we have uh, a former member of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly, the head of the third committee, Matteo Mekac, who's become director of the ODIR. And I look forward to working very closely with him. He will come to Copenhagen and I see uh, Peter Julians. And uh, maybe we could also meet with you sometimes in uh, mid-March. He will come and also strengthen the relationship that we have together with the Odir. Um, I have a note also from Gustavo uh, regarding Doris's question about the contributions. Uh, of course, uh, we allow delegation to make an annual contribution whenever uh, best in the budget year, and provided that, of course, they uh, do this before the annual session. But we have positive results during the last years, all delegations have provided their dues. And uh, uh, last year, only two, delega two delegations have not yet uh, paid last year. But uh, in general, our budget is well financed and we appreciate very much uh, the participating states uh, and the delegations uh, for providing us the resources to work. But I understand now the uh, treasurer wanted to take the floor. Uh, Peter, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. And uh, Doris, thank you for your two questions. Uh, I would just uh, like to add a little bit uh, to the Secretary General because uh, Doris, uh, as you probably heard, you know, we are within the frame of the expenditure. And that is why we got a positive assessment from our uh, auditor. Uh, but you raised uh, questions about uh, some countries who have not paid their uh, fees uh, uh, yet. Uh, you have to remember that this report was made in mid-January and there is a long time from uh, mid-January and until now, perhaps they have paid now I haven't heard otherwise. So uh, I will, um, of course, you know, because you asked the questions, I will ask uh, the secretariat to brief me. And if we have a problem, I'll get back to you. But this report was made in mid-January. And I also wanted to highlight in my report at the last page, you now have uh, the possibility to see uh, the whole sec secretariat. And you can also see that we have two persons who are paid for by the Italian government. Thank you very much for that. And we have one pay person uh, employed at us, paid by the German government. Also, thank you very much. And that is why it is very, very important that we keep on working, making my report, uh, all this uh, budget, make it as transparent as possible because we have a special obligation as our organization to be transparent. So everybody can see how are we spending the money and who are taking which the, the decisions. Thank you very much for your questions. I hope I, I answered them. And thank you, Barnett. Thank you very much, um, Treasurer, dear Peter. Thank you very much also for making reference to the uh, post table that we have uh, um, put as an annex to your report. You will see from this uh, that um, finally, we have a total gender balanced uh, staff uh, and uh, we of course still need to work on uh, on the positions of uh, some of the staffs but it's uh, totally gender balanced now and something that uh, will please some of our members and also geographically diverse um now we have uh, before we close these agenda items i think vice president guliev still wanted to reply to the armenian question Thank you very much, uh, dear Roberto. Uh, I'd like to briefly answer to the question uh, raised my Armenian colleague, Mr. Konjarian. Uh, but before answering, I want to repeat once more that the Azerbaijani delegation is ready for constructive dialogue under the all species of the OECPA. I still appreciate your efforts, uh, Mr. Secretary General, to bring in some arm to delegations to discuss the ways of the possible, uh, let's say, uh, cooperation and reconciliation uh, between our two countries. Because I do believe that we have to answer to one simple question, whether we want to live in eternal peace or in eternal war. Azerbaijan is ready and uh, in favor of living in eternal peace. 
because region now really needs peace and reconciliation. This is the first comment. But second, as my um, the, the, my colleague Ar uh, from Armenia uh, touched upon the issue of prisoners, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that yes, Azerbaijan is uh, fully uh, committed to the uh, provisions of the 10th of uh, November statements. Uh, under the statement, Azerbaijan has returned uh, today, until today, or as of today, 71 prisoners of war and detainees to Armenia and facilitated retrieval of bodies of more than 1,300 Armenian military servicemen. But as for the question regarding six to Armenian nationals detained in the course of the counter-terrorist operations by presenting them as a prisoner of war to, the, to be transferred under the paragraph eight of the trilateral statement of the November, I think uh, it is not uh, correct because they were uh, detained after, signed, uh, after signing the 10th of November uh, uh, statement uh, after the war has stopped. This is why, unfortunately, these uh, people are not considered as a, uh, as a prisoner of war uh, because uh, it, they have been detained as a result of counter-terrorist operations conducted by the relevant Azerbaijani uh, law enforcement forces. But unfortunately, after uh, interrogation, the, the many facts have been revealed that this group, all members of which are citizens of Armenia, mainly from Shrak province, they transferred, as I said, after signing this agreement to Azerbaijan in order to commit this uh, act of uh, uh, terror act. Unfortunately, as a result of such a terror acts, four Azerbaijan servicemen killed and one civilian have been seriously wounded. This is why I would say that they are not entitled for release, but I do recommend my Armenian colleague to uh, uh, commit uh, to, uh, I mean, implement to fulfill their commitments under the uh, as I said, uh, uh, trilateral agreement uh, on, uh, on 10 November as well as 11 January 2021. But in, in conclusion, I'm just repeating that uh, this is a right time for Armenian delegation to look or to consider our proposal to uh, seek the way of the peace and the coexistence between two countries and to work on the comprehensive a uh, peace agreement that really could uh, lead our region to the level of uh, really prosperity and uh, uh, can serve the best interests of our peoples. Thank you, dear Roberto, for giving me a chance to make some clarification, the question that raised by, by Armenian colleagues. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I think the colleague from Armenia wants to briefly also reply to this. Uh, it was this agenda item, and we move on to the report of um, Lord Bonnes in his capacity as chairperson of the subcommittee on votes. Mr. Konyora. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Montelia. As my colleague from Azerbaijan, Mr. Goliath, speaks about trilateral statement, I would like to highlight some important thing. Uh, look, the first provision of the statement holds that a complete ceasefire and termination of all hostilities in the area of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is hereby declared and that the parties shall stop at their current positions. Yet more than a month ago, month into the ceasefire, Azerbaijan launched military operations in the direction of Hintagir and Khazabert, the two villages of the Hadrut region that remained under Armenian control. On 11th December 2020, the special forces of Azerbaijan launched an attack in the area in an attempt to wipe out these villages of their ethnic Armenian inhabitants so that the entire region of Hadrut would come under Azerbaijan's de facto control. As a result of this unprovoked aggression, Azerbaijan captured 64 Armenian servicemen in violation of its ceasefire obligations under the trilateral statement. In an attempt to justify its actions in Hadrut, Azerbaijan is now again attempting to shift the blame on Armenia by invoking groundless narrative of fake anti-terror operation and an alleged sabotage group to deployed by Armenia and portraying the Armenian prisoners of war as terrorists. Dear colleagues, in tri trilateral agreement, it is fixed that all prisoners of war, hostages and detained people should be released and returned to their countries. Now Azerbaijan 
trying to portray Armenian prisoners of war in another way as a terrorist, refused to implement its obligations. And then my Azerbaijani colleagues, meantime, come here and say that we are going and we want to, to create peace and security. I repeat again, if our Azerbaijani colleagues want to create peace and security in, in the region, they should implement their obligations according to the trilateral statement and also their obligations under international humanitarian law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. You are muted, Mr. President. We don't hear you. Mr. President. Yep, go ahead. Mr. President, we don't hear I, you. My, go ahead. My apologies, sorry. Uh, my, I think we have to bring this uh, item to a close because notwithstanding the delay which I caused at the beginning with my uh, technical problems, which are still not resolved, we are overrunning. And uh, I think we've exhausted, not exhausted, but uh, had sufficient discussion on one particular item now. So we really ought to... Uh, we really ought to proceed because the next item is of extreme uh, Im importance. Um, the only point I wanted to pick up out of the questions and that you dealt with, and that's the uh, association of uh, former presidents, um, and you spoke of their involvement in certain, there may be an opportunity to involve them in certain uh, projects or indeed uh, visits on the ground. Um, I do think and I'm sure you will understand that members, uh, and it will be a matter for the new bureau rather than the old bureau, but that before anything is done that created a precedent, they would want to be consulted about that involvement of uh, former members rather than uh, leaving uh, the situation to present members. But that's the only comment I, I would make in addition, and I hope you could agree with that. Absolutely, Mr. President, Sorry. on that issue, as well as any other issue, any initiative that the International Secretariat or the Parliamentary Assembly will take will always have to be vouched and decided by the Bureau. That's uh, very clear in my mind, and there is no unilateral action that we will engage in without no, no. Uh, clear uh, support of the, of the Bureau or the Standing Committee. But I think we can move on uh, to your agenda items now, Mr. President, uh, number six. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, and. Uh, Colleagues, uh, this is the report of the uh, chairperson of the World Working Rules of Procedure and Working Practices. Um, and the, the most important element of that is the um, consideration of the emergency provisions to the uh, rules of uh, procedure. Um, I've indicated on a number of occasions that whether we could meet uh, physically uh, in July or not, uh, in a normal annual session, we uh, must elect new leadership. Uh, we cannot go on recycling ourselves. And I don't think that would be either correct or uh, democratic. Um, so we need to know uh, that we can establish procedures uh, which enable us to hold remote elections um, without gathering in Bucharest. And as you have alluded, and I alluded briefly in my report, um, stand uh, sadly, but understandably, and uh, colleagues from Romania will explain this uh, further when we get to the item. Um, it is now known that we cannot have an annual meeting in the usual way in Bucharest. And uh, the possible way forward has been discussed by the President's Working Group of the Bureau um, and indeed by the Bureau itself in December. Uh, and our thoughts on how we may deal with this matter have been sent to members of the Standing Committee for their consideration uh, today. Now, the International Secretariat tell me that they will assess the most remote, secure remote conferencing options to ensure the conduct of a safe and effective voting method, uh, given that we will not 
have an annual session in the traditional way. It is extremely important that this uh, provision is adopted. And I'm just going to remind members that according to our rules, that's our existing rules, uh, decisions in the standing committee are taken according to the principle of consensus minus one by heads of delegation or their appointed substitute. So what that means, as I'm sure you understand, that those of us, myself included, who are not leaders of a delegation, don't have a vote. Uh, now, the uh, procedures, the papers have been adopted, they've been discussed by the Bureau, and I only would say one other thing, that if anybody is tempted uh, to uh, prevent the adoption of uh, these emergency proceedings, they will have created a situation where we have no annual meeting and no means of having the elections, which will be, I think, quite disastrous for the Parliamentary Assembly and democracy and, frankly, for our reputation in the outside world. So whilst I'm happy to take any questions, um, I do now ask whether any head of the delega of delegations in this meeting objects to the emergency provisions which have been circulated and are the articles one, two, and three, uh, and four, uh, which you have before you. Has anybody any objections? Okay. Hello? I don't see any- No objections? I don't see any objections. Of course, the, the, the head of the Romanian delegation would like to speak later on, but uh, no objection on this uh, agenda item and on this proposal that you've made that I'm aware of. Um, I'm just double checking with my colleagues over the chat. No objections, Mr. President. I think you can declare. Right, thank you very much. Can you still hear me, Roberto? Yes, I can. Yes, Are I can. you still hearing me? Yes, yes, I can. You are still hearing me? Yes, yes I am. Good. Well, good, thank you. Well, colleagues, thank you very much indeed for accepting those emergency uh, provisions. Um, I believe that you have, uh, you have uh, done something this afternoon uh, which will save democracy and the continuity of our, and renewal too, of, of our, our assembly. One other matter which I would like to uh, address is that when the Bureau met last month, we looked at the question of elections to Bureau positions. Um, and that, of course, means committees as well as the officers. And that since elections couldn't be held in 2020, we will hold under the remote system elections for positions with terms which uh, initially end in 2020. Uh, and 2021, and they will be held this coming July. In a procedure which is already in the rules of procedure, the three candidates who receive the highest number of votes will be elected for three years, and the three candidates elected for two years, uh, the next three candidates for two years, so completing the mandates of the elections we were unable to hold in 2020 and uh, we expect to fill two additional vacancies, meaning that there'll be elections for eight vice presidents in addition to the president and to the treasurer uh, during the remote voting session that we will have to hold in 2021. Can I just mention that we have indicated in correspondence to the Standing Committee that the Subcommittee on Rules of Procedure and Working Practices and the President's Bureau Working Group have been looking at revision of rules. Uh, it was our intention 
to submit these to an annual meeting in uh, in Bucharest. I think it's obvious that it has to be a future meeting. Um, the Secretariat has been looking at suggestions to bring the rules in general up to date. But uh, whilst our intention was to circulate these next month um, for consideration uh, by uh, delegations and submission of the views received uh, put to the Bureau, um, I think that timetable may well have to be altered given that we are not going to have the annual meeting uh, that we envisaged. So I don't know whether Mr. Montella, the Secretary General, wishes to add anything to that, but I think really um, it is now work in progress. N nothing to add. Mr. Secretary General? Nothing to add, but just to agree with what you just said, indeed. Uh, First of all, I appreciate uh, that the members have adopted these uh, exceptional rules that allow us now to have a leadership elected in, in July 2021. However, for the greater uh, reform of our rules of procedures, which uh, Ambassador Notel has worked on for the last uh, months and has already submitted a first draft, uh, this will be a longer process now because, of course, this is a process which uh, requires also in-person meetings, requires also some discussions with uh, some participating states who have expressed in the past uh, concerns about the aspects of our rules. So we will take our time. We're not in an urgency. We have our rules of procedures. They need uh, some modernization, but uh, there is nothing dramatic in not adopting them now in July in, uh, in Bucharest or wherever the annual uh, meeting or the meeting in July will take place. But um, we will start a process. So the, as you said, the, the timetable indeed is changed. But thank you very much for that. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. And that being the case, if nobody else has anything to raise on this item or any questions to pose, I propose to go to item number seven, uh, which is the report of the chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Countering Terrorism, Mr. Reinhold Lepakka. Um, and uh, may I ask him to uh, take, take the floor? Mr. President, if you allow me, before we move on to the next agenda item, I think uh, the head of the Romanian delegation wanted to take uh, the floor under this agenda item. So I think we give him an opportunity to take the floor now, and then we move on to the special representative. Uh, with your permission, and then I'll give it. Yes, 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 indeed. I thought we were going to deal with that when we got to item 10, but no, certainly. Maybe. Certainly, Mr. Radu, please. Please. Sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, uh, of course, um, there is a clarity. First of all, uh, with your permission, I will introduce myself. It's my first participation in the OCPA and um, I'm a member of the Romanian Senate. It, uh, my second term started in December. Um, I've been the vice president of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the past and uh, I dealt a lot with uh, election law problems uh, here in Romania. So it's an honor to, uh, to join uh, this assembly. Uh, and I have the honor to, to chair the new delegation of uh, Romania to the OCEPA that was uh, established just one week ago on the 17th of February. Um, and um, we, we read carefully the provisional rules uh, and uh, we, we know that our uh, former representative in the Bureau of the Assembly contributed to, uh, with some of the amendments that were included in the initial phases of the drafting. Um, and following the discussions within the delegation and with the uh, leadership of the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies here in Romania, um, I want to point, point out that um, um, we clearly agree with the, what uh, has been uh, approved uh, by the Assembly regarding the uh, uh, rules of, uh, of having the Assembly in emergency situations. Uh, nevertheless, I want to point out that we will have a transition uh, for, the, uh, for the next months, uh, respectively for the... Uh, a plan session uh, that we initially uh, established for uh, to happen in Bucharest, and that we uh, proposed a, a specific proposal for this transition period that would include, um, as was uh, indi requested by some of the uh, speakers earlier, uh, a combined, a mixed uh, session with with a the possibility to have a physical a presence um, uh, for the bureau and for the, the rest of the um, work of the assembly to have uh, virtual um, sessions. 
so we, we could uh, detail that in uh, in the, the point 10 of the agenda, of course. Uh, just to point out that I think uh, for the uh, uh, decision that has been taken, there needs to be um, uh, an addendum uh, about the transition period and what will happen in uh, uh, in Bucharest uh, for uh, this summer. Thank you very much. Mr. President, we don't hear you. Mr. President, we don't hear you. Any better? Yep. Any no. better? Yes, yes, we hear you now. Better? Yes. Good, thank you. Well, thank you to our Romanian uh, colleague. And uh, I mean, let us, I think, let us wrap this up uh, at this stage in the meeting uh, rather than leaving it until item 10 when we're going to be right at the very end uh, of the agenda. And I, I don't certainly want uh, that. Uh, to run out of time. I think we understand uh, the concerns that our colleagues from Romania and the Romanian parliament have, and that they believe at the present moment um, it has to be a virtual meeting, save and accept a meeting of the Bureau. Um, I had the opportunity to have a short word with our Romanian colleague uh, before this meeting, and uh, I have to say that we st still are very appreciative of the offer which is being made um, in these these difficult the difficult times. But I think uh, we will uh, have to say at this stage that clearly this needs consideration by uh, the uh, Secretariat uh, and the Bureau and uh, to be one absolutely transparent uh, to see whether there are any alternatives uh, which would be not better than being involved with the Romanian parliament in and around Bucharest, but whether there are any alternatives which rather would fit the needs of the assembly uh, and its meetings in what will be an ex extraordinary, in every sense of the word, uh, annual meeting. So uh, I thank our Romanian colleagues and hope that they understand that that has to be our position and that we can't, as it were, accept at this moment without further consideration because very few people in this room have actually knew what the position was going, uh, which, which was going to prevail in Bucharest uh, until, until this moment. So w with that, I hope that perhaps... Uh, with the uh, consent of our colleagues from Romania and others, we can, uh, as it were, leave matters. But I see Mr. Brando would like to uh, rips respond. Uh, thank Please you, Mr. Do. President. Just, just a short uh, comment. We would just uh, like to make sure that uh, when the Bureau and the uh, Secretariat would uh, look into this matter, uh, we would be uh, very glad to, to participate in the uh, process of finding a solution. And I think we will be able to uh, support uh, solutions that would comply with the health and safe, safety regulations that, uh, that are imposed throughout the world right now. So please uh, let us uh, be involved in, in the process moving forward as, uh, as the country that is willing to, uh, to sustain the, uh, uh, the assembly this year as much as possible. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you very much. And as I say, I'm sure that we will, uh, uh, the Secretariat will involve uh, your Parliamentary Secretariat uh, in discussions. And uh, I, I, I know that you will understand uh, the problems which uh, our Secretariat may may feel uh, would arise from the suggestions which you're current currently making. And you will not. Un you will understand that if we have to find any alternatives, it will only be with the greatest of regret, and underlining our uh, thanks to uh, Romania for trying to uh, find a way forward in these extremely difficult times. So, may I now actually move to item seven, the report of the chair of the ad hoc committee on counterterrorism. And uh, I would be grateful if we could uh, try to keep to the current timetable, um, which so far we're not doing too badly, having caught, caught up a bit. 
uh, one other matter which I ought to just mention before uh, giving the chair, um, giving the floor to uh, Mr. Lepracta, uh, and that is that the interpretation will finish at half past four. Uh, and if the meeting goes beyond half past four, uh, it will be solely uh, in English. But there is no way in which the interpretation can be extended. But uh, since we are only five minutes off uh, off our timetable at the moment, um, I'm hopeful that it won't be necessary. Um, the chair of the Countering Terrorism, please. Reinhold, you have the floor. Yeah, dear president, uh, dear colleagues, distinguished colleagues, I'm very pleased to address uh, the standing committee uh, in person here on behalf uh, of the ATOC Committee on Countering Terrorism and update uh, you about our most recent efforts and, and visions for the future. It has been 10 months since my last report and I am satisfied to say that the CCT has remained uh, extremely active despite uh, the situation we face now. In fact, terrorism still poses a major threat to international security and regional stability. The circumstances might be changing, but this multifaceted threat is adapting fast and terrorist groups are quickly finding new ways to bring their agenda forward. The chain of terror attacks in the fall of 2020 served as a star, uh, strong reminder uh, of how complex and uh, volatile the current situation is. Clearly, the socio-economic distress caused by the pandemic has offered new opportunities for terrorists and violent extremists to recruit new sympathizers targeting the most vulnerable layers of our societies. For instance, the crisis has revitalized many radical movements of right-wing extremists, which became especially dangerous for governments and parliaments. We re realize uh, also here in Austria, in a strong manner, both radical Islamic groups and right-wing uh, extremists use similar communication strategies for recruiting uh, new activists, especially on the social media. And all these networks pose a serious threat to democracy and peace, regardless of their ideologies. That is why supporting well-planned international assistance and promoting responsible solutions to challenge uh, posed by detained terrorists in Syria and Iraq, usually in extremely poor conditions. I was there personally in December in these camps in Syria, should be a top priority in our counterterrorism efforts. Similarly, similarly, we must actively prevent radicalization in Europe and refine our de-radicalization programs. If we fail, the consequences of our short-sighted policies could haunt us for decades. At the OEC EPA, we will continue working on these challenges, both through our official activities and also through informal dialogue. If we want to be effectively in this fight, we can only do so through national and international partnership which should be at very least as strong as the terrorist networks itself. Dear colleagues, I believe the CCT has been particularly successful in promoting a greater parliamentary engagement in counterterrorism and in expanding our network of partnership through concrete activities and formal agreements. Like our agreement, our memorandum of understanding with UN OCT, our cooperation with PAM. Uh, here we are doing a lot. I personally believe there are five areas where we can play a significant role. First, prevention of terrorism, especially online and in the context of crisis such as COVID-19, protecting our youth. Secondly, prosecution, reintegration and de-radicalization, very important issue. Third, we should not forget the support to the victims of terrorism. Fourth, and here we did a lot, uh, especially the colleagues before me in 2018 and 19, speaking of border security and information sharing. And fifth, intersection of terrorism 
with other serious threats such as bioterrorism, terrorism financing, nuclear proliferation, and hybrid threats. By the way, today we have a meeting together with you in OCT where I can take part in, in, in some meetings on behalf of OECEBA organized by the United Nations. So we are seen uh, as a strong voice uh, for the parliaments uh, by UN. A lot of work has been carried out to better understand the radicalization dynamics, for instance, in the context of the ongoing pandemic. And uh, we had also a special uh, debate on assessing the terrorist threat and existing de-radicalization efforts amidst a crisis context together with the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. At the next parliamentary conference on countering terrorism on the 15th of April, this conference, which will be co-organized with uh, IPA, CES, and other partners as a follow-up to similar events held in 2017 and 2019 in St. Petersburg. In other areas of our counterterrorism agenda, we are still engaging with the hope of being equally impactful. This is the case with the supporting of victims of terrorism, as I mentioned before, building on the findings of our 2018 Madrid conference, we took a leading role in several expert consultations with the United Nations at the end of last year and early this year. To consolidate this work, we are considering uh, a, a targeting resolution for our next annual session uh, in Bucharest, which we discussed now before. Finally, in the future, we might be called to do more on complex issues such as repatriation of foreign terrorist fighters. A very difficult question. To do so, we shall continue to build on our strategic partnership, leverage on our unique parliamentary assets, and monitor regional developments uh, to promptly tackle key threats as they emerge. Uh, for more in information, please uh, use the report, which was uh, circulated. I encourage all of you uh, to engage in our work. In fact, please let me know if you're interested to join this committee. We are always looking uh, for committed parliamentarians. We are losing them when they are uh, appointed as ministers. Uh, we, we, we have several um, of these uh, cases. So please join the committee. Maybe you will be the next minister. To conclude, I would like to thank our president, our secretary general and his staff uh, really for the strong support uh, which we uh, um, receive and uh, yeah let's continue with our work as we have done it uh, uh, now and I'm quite uh, optimistic uh, that uh, we uh, can uh, yeah, meet uh, in, in, in person and restart also our work in the field as we had done before uh, this COVID uh, pandemic uh, started. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your report. Uh, and uh, as you rightly observed, it's been distributed. So uh, I haven't seen anybody wanting to uh, uh, take the floor on this item, in which case I will uh, move on uh, if by agreement uh, to item eight, the report of the acting chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Migration. Margareta. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to start uh, to say that uh, the report is, uh, I'm sorry for being a little bit diffuse because we have a, a surrounding noise here in the room where I'm sitting. Uh, first of all, I would like to say as, uh, uh, that uh, the complete document, uh, the complete uh, report is sent out to all delegates if you want to have uh, a more wider uh, information. Uh, so I will just be very brief and short about uh, our work. And I would like to start to say thank you to the Secretariat for their work, for all their efforts, and particular to Ms. Farima Daftari, because she is a star. She is 
really assisting and helpful for the whole, all members of the committee. And we have managed to be very eff effective and uh, also cover quite a lot of the challenges we could see in the OSCE area uh, during the COVID-19 and migration. I will in my report focus on four uh, topics that we have uh, particular uh, worked with and I will also say a few words about our next step. Uh, the committee managed to hold, as I said, eight one uh, online events focusing on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on refugees and migrant communities and the humanitarian uh, situation in Lesbos and Bosnian Herzegovina in particular. The first virtual meeting in May explored the various uh, impact of the pandemic and was joined by uh, the European uh, member of the European Parliament, uh, former Vice President of OSCE, Ms. Isabel Santos. And we followed up with a web dialogue on protecting refugees and migrants during the pandemic. Camps are closed, centers are locked down. The recommendations which emerged from this discussion were included in the report OSCE PA vs COVID-19 that was issued in July. Uh, and the two following one uh, line meeting addressed the humanitarian crisis in Lesbos following the fire which destroyed the Moria camp, including a meeting with the Greek migration minister and a round table with non-governmental organizations. I would like to thank committee vice chair, uh, Lord Alf Dabs, for facilitating these activities and his efforts to promote the relocation of uncompanied minors from Greece and elsewhere. While it is encouraging to hear that the Aegean Island have been partially decongested, the committee is concerned by the poor living conditions of asylum seekers. We are also eager to find out more about the nature of the permanent reception facilities which are being built with the EU assistance. And when it comes to Bosnia-Herzegovina, there has be, uh, we have uh, been experiencing increased mig migratory pressure on migrants, have sought alternative routes to the European Union via through its border with Croatia. The committee sought to draw attention to the impending humanitarian crisis surrounding the planned closure of the Lipa camp in the Northwest. On the 7th December, we held meetings with the representatives of the OSCE mission, UNHCR, and a number of NGOs working on the ground. And we found these discussions very uh, valuable because it's get another uh, impression that we could have got just by talking to our colleagues. And I think th these contacts is very valuable for the future work of the committee. Unfortunately, one week later, frustrated uh, by the continued deadlock, migrants set fire on the Lipa camp, compounding the crisis. Political leaders at all levels must overcome differences to find a human, durable solution to the humanitarian crisis. Uh, uh, a disturbing phenomenon through Southeast Europe is that of violent pushbacks of migrants. The organizations we met with have diligently documented these pushbacks involving border police uh, from both European Union and known EU member states and have shared with us their recommendation, recommendations for enhancing independent human rights monitoring mechanism. And NGOs are very active and carrying out important work and should not be penalized for their activities. And I would like to thank the committee vice chair, uh, Dr. Gudon Kugler from Austria for keeping the humanitarian situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina high on the agenda and commend her for helping secure 1 million euro in humanitarian assistance from her government. EU Pact on Migration Asylum is another topic that we have followed. And uh, 
we have had a meeting with uh, the office of the European Commissioner, uh, Ms. Ilva Johansson, and we will continue to follow up uh, the EU's humanitarian assistance to Syria. When it comes to another topic that's very important, and it's uh, the combating trafficking along migration routes. The committee has expressed interest in learning more about combating human trafficking along migration routes and engaged in discussions last week on future cooperation with the OSCE special representative and coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings and build uh, on the network of the PA specialist, special representative Chris Smith. And I would also like to highlight the work done by Dr. Heidi Fry, special representative on gender, who always highlight how COVID-19 have affected women in uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, next step for the committee would be to continue the follow-up development in Lesbos and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we will try to carry out filed visits as soon as possible. But right now, it seems to be difficult uh, because of the COVID. We also agreed to pursue cooperation with the OSCE on combating human trafficking along migrants' routes, and particular focus on children. And the committee will continue to monitor implementation of the EU's migration and asylum pact. And we see it's really needed for the independent human rights monitoring. And I would also encourage you to participate in the web conference organized by the, by the United Kingdom House of Lords and ALFTAPS on the 5th March on humanitarian emergencies, voluntary resettlement of refugees and assisted voluntary returns of migrants. And I would like to highlight here that uh, in the panel will uh, Dr. Heidi Fry take part. As, uh, and speak about the Canada's resettlement programs. My concluding remarks is that my appeal to you is a, vac a vaccination program. And it's very important that it could be rolled out. And when it's rolled out, please also include the undocumented person persons. It is absolutely regrettable that the pandemic has been used as a pretext to suspend refugees resettlement program. And last year, fewer than 23,000 23, refugees were resettled globally through the United Nations Refugee Agency. And this was the lowest figure in the nearly 20 years. And I look forward to reporting to you at the Bucharest annual session where we plan to present our recommendation in form of a resolution. And I say, uh, just as the former speaker, please, if you are interested in the work of the committee, uh, contact me or uh, Ms. Farima Daftari at the Secretariat, because uh, quite a lot of our members are also going further on to other duties, maybe as minister or to the European Parliament. Uh, so there are room for more engagement. And finally, I would like to say that the migration exemplify the importance of multilateralism and how a play, uh, and have a place to fulfill in the OSCE perspective on security based on the Helsinki Final Act, as well as the Paris Charter. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much, Margareta, and thank you for uh, taking on the chairmanship of uh, this important committee uh, when uh, that became, uh, when the chair became vacant. Now, you've given us a very full report. I again don't see anybody seeking the floor to raise any questions, in which case I will move on to item nine, uh, the reports of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly Special Representatives. Um, sorry? No, Mr. President, because under these uh, two uh, ad hoc committees reports, I think the colleague from the Armenian delegation wanted to take the floor. Well, I, of course, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to stop any, 
I wouldn't want to stop any uh, discussion about uh, the, the report, but may I appeal to colleagues not to use this as an opportunity uh, for furthering uh, the conversation about what is a very important matter to uh, national delegations, but we do have a lot of ground to cover. So I hope that the question is going to be directed specifically uh, to uh, Margareta and this report. So the, um, our colleague from Armenia has the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. I have questions for Mr. Lopatka and Madam Sederfeld. Uh, during um, uh, war, aggression uh, initiated by Azerbaijan against Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Azerbaijan, with strong support of Turkey, recruited and deployed in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict zone uh, foreign terrorist fighters and jihadists. This fact uh, is well acknowledged by international society. There were credible reports by well-known media outlets. United States, France, Russia, and other countries confirmed this fact on an official level. Uh, so now my question to Renat Lopatka is, uh, have you uh, have taken note of this terrible development in the region? And how is the report you are preparing going to address this issue? OECPA has adopted a vast number of resolutions related to countering terrorism, and we would like to hear your views and thoughts on what steps the Parliamentary Assembly should take to ensure implementation by such participating states as Azerbaijan and Turkey of their commitments in countering terrorism, especially in the light of the recent developments in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict area, where these two countries actively engaged terrorists and used them to achieve their political goals. They used terrorists as a proxy army against also civilian population. And this is OSCE area on, of responsibility. And now my question to uh, Ms. Margarita Sederfeld. In the same recent war that Azerbaijan launched against Nagorno-Karabakh last fall, the almost entire population of Nagorno-Karabakh was displayed. These people are now going back to rebuild their homes if, uh, if their towns and villages are actually under the control of the Nagorno-Karabakh authorities. To say this, uh, this is migration would be terrible uh, understatement. This was forced displacement amidst the COVID pandemic resulting into a double humanitarian crisis. And now again, my question, have you have taken note of this terrible development in the region and how is the report you are preparing going to address this issue? Thank you very much. Well, I, I'll give the floor to uh, the chair of the uh, terrorism committee uh, for a brief reply. Uh, I now understand that uh, other members wish to uh, come in on this. It appears to uh, be, uh, again, the discussion really about the dispute uh, between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. And really, we cannot have every item on the agenda uh, turn to, to this discussion. But I will allow the chair of the Terrorism Committee to respond and Margareta to speak, to reply to the question which has been raised um, also by the Armenian representative. Mr. President, the chair of the uh, Fighting Against Terrorism Committee is not present at the moment. He had to go to the Austrian Parliament. Well, we shall have to pass on then. Okay. Uh, I understand the head of the Turkish delegation wanted to uh, take the floor. Is that correct? Indeed. Right, so Mr. Altenach, the head of the Turkish delegation. Can you hear us? This is the Turkish delegation. Can you hear us? This is the interpreter for Turkish delegation. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Okay. Distinguished President, 
and respected Secretary General, I would like to greet you all with my deepest respect. And please accept my thanks for organizing this meeting. It's a challenging time as expressed before and organizing this meeting in challenging times is a great success and congratulations for this achievement. However, especially the Armenian colleague is uh, referring to Turkey and his discourse and his rhetoric referring to Turkey and it is a blaming campaign, a part of the blaming campaign by Armenian side. And it's a continuation of this blaming attitude and it's very unfortunate. And it is very disappointing for us to see Armenia continues its this campaign. And the allegations, especially radical warriors are being sent, especially the allegations are, com we completely reject these allegations and accuse us. They are unfounded, ill-founded. And such ill-founded approach brings peace and security neither to the region nor to the countries. It will not serve to the benefit of the region or to the countries. When we, we should open a new space and we should start to become a part of the solution. It's high time that we concentrate our effort and resources on solutions. And both sides, both parties, considering their negative feelings and negative attitudes, both parties, it's very difficult for both parties to be focusing on a solution. We see this, but this is not impossible. And it's possible, it's feasible. We all need this approach, focusing on a solution. Uh, Organization of Security and uh, Cooperation needs this approach and we are ready to make any contribution to make this possible. Turkey believes that we can pave the way for a sustainable peace and security. There will be new opportunities, sure, and the whole region will be benefiting from this process of peace building. The Armenian side will also win it's a win-win situation we firmly believe that armenia will benefit from it too therefore and i kindly request the armenian government to make a change in their attitude and thank you very much for giving the floor thank you thank you very much now i i'm going to uh, close this debate after there has been a short, and I do beg uh, you to be short, uh, from uh, Vice President Aze Guliev, and I will then ask uh, the chair of the Terrorism Committee and the chair of the uh, Migration Committee uh, if they wish to respond uh, shortly to any of the points. But I am not, I'm going to close the speaker's list on this item uh, and then go on to the reports of special representatives. Uh, Mr. Vice President Guliev. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, uh, for giving me a chance to make some <clears throat> comment on what uh, our Armenian colleague has said concerning the forum fighters. Of course, it is regretful that Armenian colleague is seeking all opportunity to attack my country, but we have witnessed now that he is unfortunately spreading false information about the situation when it comes to the forum fighters. I do believe that Armenia is the last country who can speak about the uh, anti-terrorism because this country, unfortunately, officially uh, was the promoter and supporter of uh, terror attacks in uh, many cases in my country, but I don't want to go into details of that issue. But, uh, uh, but unfortunately, after having uh, uh, defeated in the battlefield, Armenian propaganda machine uh, spread this false information as if Azerbaijan used these mercenary or the, uh, these terrorist uh, groups. Uh, as you know that, uh, Mr. President and dear colleagues, there is no proof, there is no evidence about that. I do recommend uh, my Armenian colleague uh, stop uh, making such uh, a groundless statement because it doesn't bring any benefit uh, to Armenia even though it uh, very, very uh, rushed the harms 
already fragile uh, the situation of dialogue between two countries. Uh, but uh, if you look at the real situation, you can easily see that there are many uh, evidences, many cases when Armenia officially recruited mercenaries from different countries and engaged, involved them into their military operation in Azerbaijan. This is why I, uh, I do believe that uh, our relevant uh, structure and relevant institutions will uh, duly assess uh, this uh, issue, this challenging issue that Armenia always promoted and supported this, uh, this type of activities, actions. As I already mentioned before, that even after signing the trilateral agreement uh, on 10 November, Armenia Socrates Group uh, have been transferred uh, to Azerbaijan in order to commit the terrorist acts. This is why uh, I do hope that Armenian delegation uh, will further uh, we will refrain from making such a gr uh, grounded uh, statement and, of course, will uh, be a, in line with the uh, ethic norms of our assembly and, the, of course, we will we'll use the parliamentary language that is necessary for our uh, dialogue that is really the best platform for the inter-parliamentary discussions and uh, resolving the issues that we have common interest. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we couldn't hear you, but I am. I understand probably you gave the floor to the head of the uh, Tourism Committee. So. Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, Mr. President, uh, Secretary General, um, speaking on, on behalf of my committee, how I understand our work, it should not be our main object uh, Looking back, I think um, here we cannot contribute uh, and it doesn't make the situation better. We should do everything to be focused on the future. And foreign terrorist fighters, of course, a big threat, a big threat. And uh, saying that um, we should do uh, everything with the support of both delegations from Armenia and Azerbaijan. And also with the support, and I say it very open, also with the support uh, of our colleagues from Russia, uh, who uh, have a strong position there, uh, to do everything that a peaceful solution is possible. And so uh, I think uh, on this stage, I don't want to say more. But I hope that our committee can contribute uh, and we can only do it with the support of you, uh, of both uh, parties. That's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. With your permission, then I give the floor to Margarita Sederfeld. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, I will also try to be very brief. Uh, first of all, the ad hoc migration group on uh, working group on um, started uh, when it was the Syrian refugee crisis and the work of the committee it had been to uh, promote discussion within the assembly on issues related to the migration and to contribute to the parliamentary exchange, exchange of best practice within the aim to enhance the OSCE work in the field of migration, as well as to improve prospect of migration, migrants in the OSE countries. We haven't focused on uh, internal migrants in OSE related to, to conflicts in the OSE uh, area. And uh, I say as yes, uh, also the chair of the uh, Committee on Countering Terrorism. It hasn't been our real focus, uh, but we have focused, as I mentioned, on the best practice and to promote the discussion in the assembly. And I think that that's the goal we have had for our work and also what we was giving uh, uh, to do. 
but of course, uh, if there is uh, an interest to expand our work, we can do it in some part, but we can't solve the conflicts. It's need to be handled in another area. I hope this was a, a replay and answer on the question. Thank you very much. Right, Ms. Secretary General, I I hope you can hear me again now. Yes, I can. I can Good, thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know what's... I didn't realise that uh, we were so far offshore. However, we now turn to the uh, next item, uh, reports of the OSCE special representatives. Can I just make one point about about this. Um, it would be appreciated if uh, the special representatives uh, could keep their uh, comments uh, as brief as is humanly possible without uh, detracting from what they have to say, because much of what they have to say is of important to reflect the work that's been, been done. Um, certainly those who have had written reports um, can perhaps summarize uh, the situation. And uh, indeed, this is a matter that working practices have uh, looked at many times, uh, the uh, desirability of That's having as many, report, um, as, many, having as many reports as possible. Um, well... Mr. President, we don't hear you now, but... Uh... I am unmuted, so I call, first of all, uh, President uh, Senator Ben Cardin, uh, the representative on uh, anti-Semitism. Senator Cardin. Well, Mr. President, first, thank you very much. And I'm, if I might, as the head of the United States delegation, I just want to first express my thanks to my fellow parliamentarians for their expression uh, of concern on the attack on the Capitol on January the 6th. It was a horrific day for our nation. But two weeks later, our democratic institutions uh, were strong and survived. And two weeks later, President Biden took the oath of office as president. The peaceful transition of power took place in the United States. And as you know, President Biden has re-engaged the international organizations such as the Paris Climate Agreement uh, and also the World Health Organization and others. Now, as I might, I'll be very brief as the special representative on anti-Semitism, racism and intolerance I've been greatly alarmed by the violent consequences of extremism, discrimination, and prejudice throughout the OSCE region. Since my last report, the coronavirus pandemic has created an unprecedented health crisis in the OSCE region, made worse by pre-existing inequalities and disproportionately impacting people of color, heightened anti-Asian discrimination, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and found attacks targeting diverse populations have followed. My report details a response to these developments, as well as the global racial justice movement spurred by the tragic death of George Floyd and other events since June of last year. This includes the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly webinars and joint Helsinki Commission event with the Office of the High Commissioner on National Minorities. At that joint event, I discussed models for addressing systemic racism in policing, law enforcement, and criminal justice, drawing on legislation I introduced to the United States Congress. I've also led efforts to provide global funding to address anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance, such as the Never Again Education Act, supporting the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, world-renowned educational programming, including survivors' testimonies. Building on efforts I advanced a decade ago, I introduced specific legislation on racial disparities in COVID-19. I also challenged xenophobic policies and rhetoric that targeted Asian, Muslim and Latino populations and supported returning voting rights to former prisoners. It is critical that parliamentarians speak out against the propaganda or hate, advance concrete solutions for healing. As we commemorate the 80th anniversary of Bobby Yar, the largest single massacre in the history of the Holocaust, I'm reminded that an individual wearing Camp Auschwitz sweatshirt and persons shouting racial slurs at our Capitol Police took part in the efforts to thwart our democratic elections on January 6th. 
I'm reminded how lies and hate can be weaponized and have dire, dire consequences. We must learn from the past or be doomed to repeat it. I ask that you read my report, and Mr. Chairman, I will be brief. Uh, the report has been distributed. Uh, review the legislation and events I mentioned and consider initiating similar activities to heal and repair the present in our own countries for a better future for all of us. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator Cardin, thank you very much for uh, that uh, very full report. And I do recommend the report that you have uh, circulated. It, it makes very interesting reading. Uh, unless anybody wants to take the floor and ask Senator Cardin anything, I will move on and ask Vice President Pascal Alizard, their special representative on Mediterranean affairs. May I do that? Pascal, the floor is yours. Allô? Oui. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? C'est bon, Pascal, on t'entend, tu peux partir. Vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, très bien. Très bien. Bien, Monsieur le Président et mes chers collègues, je vais essayer de synthétiser un petit peu mon, mon rapport. J'avais prévu en introduction de revenir sur les problématiques de radicalisation et, et, et de terrorisme euh, avec un zoom sur la Méditerranée, euh, je ne développerai pas et, et, et je me raccroche complètement sur les présentations euh, qui ont été faites par mes, mes, mes collègues qui ont travaillé sur ces problématiques migratoires et, 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 et terrorisme et euh, dont je salue les travaux et, et, et je partage d'ailleurs les, les, les analyses. Nous avons sur la Méditerranée à faire face à un certain nombre de conflits non résolus, vous les connaissez, c'est le, euh, le Sahara occidental, c'est un conflit israélo-arabe qui ne finit pas. Ce sont aussi des tensions en Méditerranée, Méditerranée orientale avec la découverte des réserves d'hydrocarbures et puis bien évidemment une situation qui ne termine pas non plus en, en Syrie et, et en Libye. Et ces zones génèrent de l'instabilité qui conduisent à une militarisation dans la région et un incident mal maîtrisé pourrait, je le crois, provoquer le, le pire. Je pense aussi que nous devons faire notre propre analyse, hein, puisque les acteurs en Méditerranée du côté européen, en tout cas de mon point de vue, nous manquons un peu de, de, de vision et, et, et de concertation, à, à commencer par l'Union européenne, mais, mais pas uniquement. J'ai envie de parler de, 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 de l'Europe au, au sens large, puisque finalement, nous ne sommes pas vraiment une puissance étatique et, et régalienne au, au sens propre du terme, plutôt dans des logiques de soft power, et, et de temps en temps, finalement, nous apparaissons les uns et les autres comme divisés et peut-être un peu faibles par rapport à ces, à ces risques. Euh, là aussi, je, je résume et vous pourrez retrouver les, les, les détails dans, dans mon rapport. En tout état de cause, je crois qu'on ne peut que regretter une relative faiblesse des acteurs européens face à la situation en Méditerranée. Et puis, troisième point avant de conclure, euh, ce sont les nouveaux acteurs en Méditerranée dont il faut bien tenir tenir compte et qui viennent un peu modifier ce, ce tableau régional. Alors, je pense bien évidemment euh, à, à, nos, à nos collègues turcs avec des revendications territoriales à faire valoir. Je parlais des problématiques de, de ressources énergétiques et puis aussi la volonté de jouer un rôle régional plus important. On peut l'entendre mais ça pose aussi quelques questions, euh, on, ne, on ne doit pas se mentir entre nous. Il faut aussi que l'on voit bien l'évolution euh, de nos amis russes et euh, redevenu et, et pour cause un acteur incontournable au Proche-Orient et, et en mer Noire, et, et, et la mer Noire c'est presque la Méditerranée. Et puis enfin, et vous savez que c'est un sujet sur lequel je travaille beaucoup, euh, la Chine qui pousse toujours un peu plus loin son commerce, ses investissements, ses accords bilatéraux, sa marine militaire et en fait la vraie question n'est pas de savoir quand la Chine, enfin si la Chine viendra en Méditerranée, mais, mais plutôt de savoir quand est-ce qu'elle y sera. Donc vous voyez, on a là 
des questions euh, latentes, euh, hors d'ailleurs périmètre de l'OSCE, mais qui doivent nous interroger, euh, car ces risques et opportunités dans notre étranger lointain ne, ne peuvent pas nous être étrangers. Et puis pour conclure, euh, vous dire, euh, mes chers collègues, que les conflits non résolus qui s'enquistent, ce n'est pas forcément une bonne chose parce que nous avons des nouveaux conflits qui menacent, des problèmes de sécurité, démographie, immigration qui ne sont pas réglés et un modèle européen universaliste qui perd un peu de terrain. L'islam politique qui progresse et qui peut être déstabilisant, là aussi je crois que nous devons avoir avec courage et respect d'ailleurs de toutes les opinions des échanges sur ce sujet, des puissances émergentes. Et puis, dernier point, et ça on l'a retrouvé dans plusieurs interventions précédentes, des politiques du fait accompli qui s'affirment au détriment du droit, et ça effectivement, ce n'est pas vraiment conforme à, à l'esprit d'Exlinky. Alors, mes chers collègues, pour conclure, vous dire qu'en tant que représentant spécial pour les affaires méditerranéennes, je souhaiterais contribuer à cette prise de conscience et souhaite aussi faciliter les, les échanges entre les différentes parties. Et puis, un petit message aussi à nos amis américains, en espérant que cette nouvelle présidence américaine ne sera pas totalement absorbée par l'Indo-Pacifique et que, et que l'Europe et que la zone OSCE ne soient pas non plus oubliées, et, et notamment la Méditerranée, qui est aussi importante pour l'avenir du monde. Voilà, Monsieur le Président, mes chers collègues, très rapidement et très résumé, mon rapport pour cette année qui vient de s'écouler. Merci bien, Président Pascal. Uh, thank you for your report. Uh, I don't think anybody has indicated that they wish to uh, speak or raise any uh, raise any questions, but uh, that doesn't mean we haven't appreciated what you have uh, been able to tell us. I go now to uh, Dr. Heidi Fry, our special representative on uh, gender issues. Heidi Fry, over in Canada. Uh, are you receiving me loud and clear? And if so, the floor, floor is yours. I you loud and clear, President. Um, I'm, good morning from Vancouver. Uh, good afternoon to the rest of you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to be speaking to you today in this format that has become for the last year the format we now uh, engage with each other, but I can't wait to meet you in person again and to see you all and to have the dynamics that we usually have. Um, the, I wanted to also take the opportunity to congratulate Roberto Montella on actually having us meet more often than we have ever met before in the history of the OSCE over this very difficult and challenging year. I mean, you can just look at the list that he left us here that showed us exactly what he has done and made us move forward in an exciting and challenging way. Um, since I spoke to you last year, I have a tendency in my report to have to tell you what developments have been made in the OSCE in general. And I wanted to say that the OSCE has actually moved forward very much uh, to bring about gender parity and gender equality um, as its commitments. And I think, um, as we saw from the Secretary General's report, um, there is a, the 2004 Action Plan for the Promotion of Gender Equality has begun to be implemented. And so we can celebrate the entry of many accomplished women into OSCE leadership. Uh, Helga Marha Smith is the OSCE's new Secretary General, uh, and the first woman to hold the post. Uh, in addition, Teresa Rubiero is a new representative on freedom of the media. And of course, uh, Anne Lind from Sweden's foreign minister is a new OSCE PA, OSCE's chairman in office. So this is good news. This is moving forward. And I think you heard on, uh, on Roberto Mantella's report that actually we have achieved gender parity within the secretariat and within the staff and that actually and, and actually moving to looking at diversity within that gender parity. So Congratulations, steps forward. I know I kind of nag you every year saying we haven't moved forward, but I'm pleased to see that we actually had. 
And I want to, um, uh, for instance, um, talk about the fact that the OSC Special Progress Report is promising better things to come. And I want to welcome Sweden as this year's OSC chair. And I was pleased to see that the Swedish chairmanship intends to place a special emphasis on strengthening gender equality in all aspects of the organization's work. I agree with the Swedish chairmanship that achieving comprehensive security must entail women. And I think we're back again to looking at how we push forward the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 to bring about women in all of the aspects of preventing conflict during conflict and post-conflict resolution. Now, I, my report for this year, as you well know, we cannot escape the fact that what COVID-19 did was actually open and exposed all the cracks that we see uh, in terms of the vulnerable people uh, globally. And this turns out to be women and girls. And in fact, what we know is that because of lockdowns, many women had been forced to stay home, facing sometimes domestic uh, violence in the home, facing a lot of societal violence. Women had been at the forefront of all of the work that's being done. Women tend to work as nurses, as physicians, as frontline workers within COVID, putting them at great risk. And many of them had lost their jobs and had to stay at home and actually do the unpaid work that they had to do trying to get their children to learn at school and to be able to get education moving further on top of trying to do their jobs online. So it's been very, very difficult. And then we've seen that many of the women who work in frontline uh, areas within healthcare ha are actually being paid very little. Uh, they work as janitorial services. They tend to do a lot of things that make them very susceptible with very low wages and very at, risky, at risk. I, I, but I wanted to talk about what, what, what I'm going to discuss in the summer, my summer report. And this is, I'm going back to what I addressed last year that we did not have time because of COVID to discuss. And I want to talk a little bit about violence against women journalists and politicians. And, and while both men and women are at risk, women politicians and journalists face additional danger simply on account of their gender. We know that they face intense scrutiny on their appearance, on their intellect, on their personal relationships, and on their pro professional credentials. They're exposed to misogynistic and sexualized online abuse. They are targeted for many reasons. They operate in the public eye. They bring attention to controversial issues and that are of importance, um, but they work in spaces reserved for men and they are not treated kindly. Um, a 2020 survey by the International Center for Journalists and UNESCO found that among respondents, 73% of female journalists had experienced online abuse and 20 reported being targeted with offline attacks that were connected to the online threats. In a 2016 survey of female women politicians by the Interparliamentary Union, it was found that 82% of parliamentarians had experienced psychological violence, targeted sexual and sexist remarks and threats, 22% had experienced sexual violence, and 26 had experienced physical violence, and we well know of the United Kingdom parliamentarian who was murdered. So we know that this is a huge problem, and, and many women journalists are trying to work uh, in, in, in a place where they are racialized if they come from different ethnic, sexual, or other minorities. In my 28 years as a member of parliament in Canada, I have faced gender-based harassment and threats from my work, especially as Minister for Gender Equality and Multiculturalism. And I know that many women in this room have faced those threats, but they don't speak about it because of fear of stigma, because of fear that they would appear to be weak, because of fear that they would be, in fact, singled out even more for speaking up. But I'm going to give you a couple of examples very quickly. Um, you take the threats of direct sexual violence against female opposition activists in Belarus, including um, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, and the relentless racist and sexist online campaigns against Diane Abbott, the first black woman elected to the United Kingdom's parliament, and the harassment perpetrated by fellow politicians and the online abuse against Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in the United States. These things are becoming worse, they're becoming violent, they're sexual, they are, they are threatening sexual violence. It's, it's something that sadly tells us that we are looking not at moving women into political life, not at moving uh, women into journalistic ability and into public service, they're going to, they're, they're going to retire.
Many of them shut down their, their social media. Many of them go, go backwards. They climb back from making statements. They are afraid. They are scared. Many of them self-censor. Many of them uh, chose to leave journalism and uh, not run as parliamentarians. What does that leave our young women who want to become parliamentarians and journalists? And I think one of the things I'm hoping that we can do is not only bring attention to the problem, but let's look at how we can act against it, how we can stop this culture of silence, stigma, and impunity that's associated with gender-based violence. And so I want us to just, I just want to highlight a few things that we can do. We can speak publicly in support of colleagues who are being targeted, and I'm appealing to all our male colleagues here, speak up for us, speak out, champion policies and laws that encourage women to report instances of sexual harassment and assault, and provide effective remedies actually do action, update our laws to recognize and address the harms caused by online abuse, demand that law enforcement improves their response to threats and violence against women politicians and journalists. And I am again appealing for all of you in this room that, that are men to be our allies, to stand up for us, to speak out, to make sure that our profession as parliamentarians remains one of dignity, one of service, um, one in which we are going to show that we are ethical people and that we can speak forward. So I, I just wanted to end with that and to say that I will continue this discussion in Bucharest. Um, I am hoping that we can actually come up with, with a lot of work that, that we can do and talk about in terms of, of actual activity and, and actual plan of action. And I mean, I, I want to also congratulate Odir um, for actually working to promote women's equal political participation and help young women to feel safe in this very honorable profession that we participate in as, as politicians. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't hear you, uh, Peter. Mr. President, we cannot hear you, but I think uh, he wanted to thank you and give the floor to Chris Smith. Mr. President, we cannot hear you. I can read lips. <laughs> Mr. Smith, floor. Chris, go ahead. Mr. Smith? Uh, we hear you. Thank, can you hear me okay? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary General Montella and um, Roberto. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. President, for your leadership during these extraordinary and difficult times. You know, Mr. President, I'm distributing a larger and longer uh, written report that I would hope that members would take a look at. Uh, but I'd like to very briefly highlight a few of the issues. Um, one year ago, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic was just beginning. Since then, it has so affected all of our lives with an estimated two and a half million uh, fatalities worldwide and a half a million in the United States alone. The coronavirus has had a serious impact on anti-trafficking efforts, on patterns of trafficking, on victims, and on survivors. Traffickers did not shut down, shut down during the pandemic. They simply adapted their activities and their methods. Meanwhile, vulnerable people were made even more vulnerable by both the virus and its deleterious effects on the global economy. Victims still needed and need today to be rescued. Survivors still needed and need today assistance. All of us who have worked, and that's everybody that's on this call, to address these challenges, uh, it has been crucial for all of us to have information and recommendations based on real concrete data. Uh, I was very pleased to participate as an expert last spring for the survey done by ODIR and UN Women on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on anti-trafficking efforts. The results showed clearly that new patterns of exploitations emerged due to increased online activity, greater use of social media, and social distancing practices. Let me just highlight a couple of those issues. Teleworking, for example, and social distancing practices increase various forms of human trafficking online. For example, there is disturbing evidence of an increase in demand for online pornography and therefore an increase in the potential for online sexual exploitation 
of trafficking victims, including and especially children. As school closures resulted in children spending more time online, where they could be vulnerable to being groomed by sexual predators and lured into trafficking situations. In fact, there's been a huge surge in reports uh, about online child exploitation all over the world, including in my own home state of New Jersey, uh, which has gone up some 75% in terms of reports. We must make it a top priority to educate our children to keep them safe online. And that, even when this pandemic passes, God willing soon, this still is a problem and it must be addressed very, very aggressively. NGOs and governments, including my own, have developed age appropriate school courses uh, to educate students on how to avoid trafficking traps and how to educate teachers as well. Matter of fact, I wrote a law called the Frederick Douglass uh, Anti-Human Trafficking Prevention and Protection Act. And that legislation really has brought together this whole effort, uh, that law, to say, we need to leave no stone unturned in protecting kids from online exploitation. And a lot of, uh, as I've mentioned before, a number of uh, groups like ECPAC uh, and others have put out very, very good guides, not just to kids, but above all to parents to know what to look for uh, when their children perhaps might even be in their room uh, quietly being groomed uh, by these predators. Uh, that material has been made available to you. We can provide more of it to you as well. Special thanks to committee chair Margareta Sitterfeld uh, for highlighting the exploitation of vulnerable children along migratory routes, uh, a preventable cruelty we all have to address and push very, very hard to end. Another issue I'd like to highlight is the need to strengthen our efforts to investigate and prosecute traffickers through financial transactions. With the rise of online sexual abuse of children, we need to address new technologies, including uh, cryptocurrencies that hide traffickers' nefarious activities from the eyes of law enforcement. I was disappointed that our governments could not come to agreement during uh, the ministerial last uh, December to strengthen OSCE commitments in relation to the effects of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The draft proposed by the United States and Belarus would, among other things, have included provisions especially addressing the issues I just raised. So hopefully uh, it also had language addressing demand. And you know, even if we do everything possible to identify and assist victims, we will not be successful until we work to eliminate the demand that fosters it. Finally, I'd like to applaud the establishment last month of the OSCE ODIR International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council or ISTAC, the first organization the first count uh, such organization uh, established by uh, any international organization. Survivors are the real experts, their experiences and their perspectives can help inform and motivate our policies uh, so that we will do more, not less, uh, and accelerate our efforts to combat this heinous cruelty. Uh, we have an advisory council similar to STAC in the United States for several years now, and it has been extremely valuable. I hope that the OSC and all of you will take full advantage of the expertise that this new advisory council offers. I would just point out uh, to you, my colleagues, I began working on combating human trafficking back in 1995 after meeting and listening to survivors. Uh, matter of fact, prior to the offering the first supplementary item on human trafficking at the 1999 OSC EPA uh, meeting in St. Petersburg, Russia, I met with several rescued trafficked women and was deeply moved and challenged to do more. Matter of fact, I invited uh, several of them to come to Washington where they testified and told their stories. And when all other persuasion uh, failed to get people to say, wake up and take a look at to what uh, trafficking was doing in terms of exploitation, when those women spoke, uh, people listened and that helped pass uh, legislation that I wrote called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. Uh, and we just celebrated the 20th anniversary on October 28th of enactment of that comprehensive law. But it was the victims that made all the difference in the world. So again, uh, thank you to the OSC and ODIR uh, for establishing this council. I look forward to working with all of you uh, going forward. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General for this time.
Mr. President, I'm afraid we don't hear you, uh, but with your permission, then I would make a point of order because our interpreters will be here until 4.30 or a little while longer, but uh, we have two of the speakers, uh, Daniela De Rieder and Oscar Mina, who would want to speak in their mother tongue. So with your permission, then I will give the floor first to Daniela De Rieder and then to Oscar Mina so that they can make use of the interpreter service and then maybe we can continue in English with the rest. So Daniela, you have the floor. Yeah, ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank, Herr Präsident, lieber Herr Geschäftsführer, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Als äh, Altpräsident Terratelli mich im äh, Dezember des vergangenen Jahres gebeten hat, Sonderbeauftragte zu werden, habe ich diese Position sehr gerne übernommen. Allerdings mit der Maßgabe, das nur bis zum Juli zu tun, wo wir dann wieder reguläre Wahlen haben werden. Und von daher gehe ich davon aus, dass dann diese Aufgaben, die ich jetzt bis dahin übernehmen kann, auch von Vizepräsidentinnen und Präsidenten übernommen werden können. Als stellvertretende Vorsitzende des Auswärtigen Ausschusses im Deutschen Bundestag ist es mir wichtig, dass wir Diplomatie, Rechtsstaatlichkeit und die Wahrung der Menschenrechte entsprechend betonen können. Und mein Aufgabengebiet als Sonderbeauftragter erstreckt sich über die Länder Belarus, die Ukraine und die Republik Moldau. Und ich danke Roberto Montella als äh, Geschäftsführer, genauso wie äh, äh, Botschafter Andreas Notella und dem ganzen Büro in Kopenhagen, aber auch, dass sie mich entsprechend unterstützt haben bei der Einführung. Was haben wir in der kurzen Zeit bereits tun können? Das sind ja lediglich zwei Monate bei denen ich die Gelegenheit hatte, dieses Amt wahrzunehmen. Wir haben bereits Gespräche geführt mit dem Kollegen Andrei Savinik, den ich auch gerne herzlich begrüße. Ich habe eben gesehen, er nimmt auch teil an unserer heutigen Sitzung. Das freut mich sehr. Wir haben ein Gespräch geführt mit der Oppositionsführerin Svetlana Tichanowskaya. Auch das war ein sehr erhellendes Gespräch. Es wird Sie, liebe Kolleginnen, liebe Kollegen, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, lieber Herr Generalsekretär, nicht überraschen, dass beide sehr unterschiedliche Positionen vertreten, was den, was den Prozess der Demokratisierung in Belarus angeht vertreten haben. Grosso modo zusammengefasst kann ich Ihnen vor allem sagen, dass es ein wenig auch um die Reihenfolge der Veränderungsprozesse geht. Herr Savinik betonte in dem Gespräch, das wir mit ihm führen konnten, dass ein sehr eingehender Verfassungsreformprozess in Gange ist, an dessen Ende ähm, entsprechende Neuwahlen stehen sollen. Frau Tichanowska ja betonte, dass sie genau eine umgekehrte Reihenfolge wünsche, nämlich erst freie und faire Wahlen und dann erst einen entsprechenden intensiven Verfassungsreformprozess. Es ist mir wichtig, dass dieser Prozess im Dialog stattfinden kann, dass wir Verständnis entwickeln für beide Seiten, denn das macht auch die Glaubwürdigkeit aus, die es in diesem Dialogprozess unbedingt braucht. Herr Savinik hat an äh, mehreren Stellen in dem Gespräch, das wir mit ihm führen konnten, äh, Dinge angesprochen, die mich sehr berührt haben. Einerseits die Frage von Transparenz und andererseits die Frage von Vertrauen. Vertrauen, dass er, so sagte er, deutlich intensiver Wünschen, Wünsche als das bis dato der Fall sei. Daran werden wir arbeiten. Das ist mein Versprechen in dieser äh, Aufgabenstelle. Da, das bedeutet für mich aber auch, dass ich das Bild komplettieren möchte, das diesen gesamten Prozess und die Lage, die Situation beschreiben kann. Herr Savinik hat angeregt, und das nehme ich sehr gerne auf, dass wir auch mit anderen Delegationen und deren Leitungen sprechen sollen. Das will ich sehr gerne tun. Wir haben ferner angesprochen, und das wird hoffentlich meine Kollegin Heidi Fry freuen, dass ja insbesondere auch der Protest in Belarus sehr stark von Frauen getragen wird, die sich nicht scheuen, dafür auch ins Gefängnis zu gehen. Wir haben für viele Dinge Verständnis, aber nicht 
sehr sensible Gruppen und das betrifft insbesondere Kinder und Jugendliche, dann für ihre Eltern haften sollen, wenn sie zu den Demonstrantinnen und Protestierern gehören. Wir haben deshalb, lassen Sie mich das nur by the way sagen, eine Aktion im Deutschen Bundestag laufen, die, das kündige ich Herrn Savinik schon einmal an, Spielzeug sammelt für die Kinder der Inhaftierten und möglicherweise auch für inhaftierte Jugendliche. Es liegen uns hier Berichte von Amnesty International vor. Und wie gesagt, ich betone noch einmal, es geht hier nicht um Anschuldigungen, sondern es geht darum, vulnerable Gruppen zu schützen. Noch einmal, Kinder haften nicht für ihre Eltern. Herrn Savinik möchte ich deshalb bitten, einerseits dafür Sorge zu tragen, dass dieses Spielzeug dann auch die Kinder erreicht und die Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die sich hier in der Runde befinden, möchte ich bitten, ihrerseits möglicherweise auch solche Aktionen vorzunehmen. Ähm, gerade das kann vielleicht auch ein bisschen Trost sein, wenn man Mama oder Papa vermisst. Das gilt ja nicht nur äh, für Belarus im Übrigen. Lassen Sie mich das noch mal aufgreifen, weil ich glaube und Lord Bonus, ich bin sehr dankbar, äh, dass wir auch äh, Gespräche führen können. Sonderbeauftragte sollen ja eine beratende Funktion auch im Hinblick auf den Präsidenten, die Präsidentschaft übernehmen. Ähm, ich habe Herrn Savinik sehr ernst genommen. Ich glaube, wir müssen hier auch Vertrauen herstellen. Darüber sprachen wir beide bereits. Und ich glaube, das ist ganz, ganz wichtig und essentiell, dass wir das gerade auch im Interesse der Werte, und da bin ich Roberto Montella sehr dankbar, dass er das nicht müde wird, in den Prozessen zu erwähnen, dass wir Werte zu verteidigen haben in der OSZE, die dann eben Frieden, Freiheit und Sicherheit auch garantieren sollen. Und dazu muss dieser Dialogprozess dienen. Lassen Sie mich aber meinen kurzen Bericht über diese zwei Monate damit beenden, dass ich sehr deutlich machen will, dass wir natürlich nicht nur einen Blick auf Belarus haben werden. Wir werden möglicherweise auch andere Delegationen hier noch mit ins Gespräch einbeziehen können, die sich auch als Facilitator in diesem Prozess mit andienen können und den Prozess mit unterstützen können. Gleich, ganz gleich, ob es sich um Belarus, um die Republik Moldau oder auch um die Ukraine handelt. Wir werden aber darüber hinaus auch noch mal schauen, wie können wir den Dialog fortsetzen bei den Nachbarstaaten. Ich habe mitgenommen aus den Gesprächen, die ich geführt habe, dass es sehr wichtig sein kann, auch Anne Linde als schwedische Ministerin für auswärtige Angelegenheiten zu gewinnen. Ähnliches gilt sicher aber auch für die russische Delegation. Lassen Sie mich einen letzten Punkt für heute machen. Ich habe immer, und da möchte ich Doris Barnett sehr herzlich danken, ich habe es immer sehr genossen, dass wir bei den Leinsweiler Gesprächen die Chance hatten, auch Konfliktparteien an einen Tisch zu holen, in einem sehr informellen Dialog einzubinden. Das ist sehr viel schwieriger geworden durch unsere digitalen Formate. Aber ich freue mich, wenn der Generalsekretär, wenn Sie, Herr Präsident, mit dafür Sorge tragen, dass wir auch unter Zeiten oder unter dem Signum der Pandemie diesen Dialog jetzt digital fortsetzen können, auch wenn er weitaus weniger informell sein wird. Aber wir werden sicher eines Tages auch wieder die Chance haben, face to face miteinander zu kommunizieren. So auch ich und Herr Savinik. Ganz herzlichen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rieder, for your kind words, and uh, I will say something about this later. Uh, I, I understand the um, colleague of Ukraine, um, Artur Grasimov from Ukraine and Andrei Savitnik from Belarus would like to reply on this agenda item, but as we have an issue with interpretation, I would like them to be patient a second. We'll give a chance to Oscar Mina to make his intervention in Italian, and after that, the interpretation will leave us, and then we'll come back to uh, Artur and Andrei with the, their intervention. Just very briefly, Roberto, have you now got my sound back? Yes, we do. We do, we do, Mr. President. We hear you. Okay. Uh, Right. Sorry. Sì, posso intervenire, Roberto? Oscar, puoi... Sì? Bene. Sì, vai, vai avanti. Allora, posso? Bene, ti ringrazio, Roberto. Presidente, anche mi rivolgo anche a lei. Ringrazio per avermi dato la parola. 
Non ho avuto molto tempo per poter preparare un, un rapporto scritto, ma sarà mia cura sicuramente prepararlo a brevissimo, anzi avevo già iniziato, quindi farò in modo di farlo per venire assolutamente all'organizzazione. Io dopo la mia nomina ho potuto seguire da vicino parecchie e fare parecchie valutazioni su questa disinformazione e propaganda che si sta ampiamente facendo svolgere un ruolo a uh, questi organismi di informazione di media in maniera molto molto difficile da interpretare perché sappiamo bene che questo è un periodo che purtroppo la disinformazione gioca appunto, un ruolo diseducativo in termini più generali genera anche problemi a livello globale. Io la mia preoccupazione più grande è quella di poter interagire all'interno di questo organismo a tutti i livelli anche e trovare una più ampia collaborazione eh, all'interno di, di questo nostro consesso. Per esempio mh, la disinformazione che eh, si divulga maggiormente è quello soprattutto sulle le, le modalità eh, trasmesse per esempio sull'economia, sulle questioni che riguardano la, le vaccinazioni. Ecco, sono tutti temi che sono stati ampiamente dibattuti nei vari paesi, ho avuto modo di seguirli anche più da vicino, avere qualche colloquio, però resta molto ancora eh, tanto da fare. E la disinformazione in questo momento riguarda soprattutto le, le questioni legate appunto a questa quest epidemia che sta letteralmente creando eh, soprattutto anche terrorismo, tra virgolette, tra i vari paesi. Io ho avuto anche una possibilità, sia come piccolo Stato nella Repubblica di San Marino, anche di poter in qualche modo interagire con il nostro governo per poter eh, aumentare anche la nostra presenza in questo senso e soprattutto eh, nel cercare di diffondere la possibilità di rifare, ovvero di, di rimettere in atto una riforma importante sull'informazione. Sono piccoli aspetti però che riguardano anche i vari paesi che compongono appunto il nostro organismo. Io su questo vorrei essere ancora più eh, interpreto, ovvero più attiva, ma purtroppo, ripeto, anche questa forma di collegamenti che facciamo, insomma, non ci danno delle grandissime ulteriori possibilità. Mi auguro di poter anche collaborare con i vari rappresentanti e con l'Ufficio eh, dell'OSCE per la libertà dei media e con la presidenza stessa dell'OSCE per le altre, altre iniziative che vorremmo mettere. Ho fatto qualche pubblicazione, non so se avete avuto l'occasione di guardare sul nostro sito dell'OSCE eh, in merito appunto a queste, a queste attività. Quindi io in questo momento mi sento a tutti gli effetti coinvolto in questa cosa e eh, citerei moltissimo che sia eh, l'attuale presidente, il segretariato e anche i rappresentanti di questa di questa dell'OSCE per la libertà dei media eh, sia mh, magari potesse essere ancora più interattiva con i nostri le nostre eh, piccole realtà come io rappresento in questo caso anche eh, all'interno dell'OSCE. Io eh, ripeto farò in modo di fare per venire più presto il mio rapporto che avevo già elaborato e quindi eh, sono a disposizione insomma per proseguire il mio lavoro. Ringrazio ancora una volta il segretario e il presidente Lord Boris. Grazie. Grazie mille, grazie mille Oscar. And I now give the floor on the former agenda item to um, Artur Gerasimov from Ukraine. Uh, very much. Um, I will try to be as short as possible. First of all, uh, We understand that now issue number one, coronavirus pandemic. Um, and I want to say thank you to the President Lord Bonas, President Seretelli, Secretary General Roberto Mantella, International Secretary, leadership of the committees and ad hoc committees, because uh, all of us see that assembly now is working not less effective than in previous years, despite the coronavirus. But we need not to forget about other issues of uh, global security. And one of them, it's Russian aggression against Ukraine. And uh, let me again remind you, almost every day, Russian troops are killing Ukrainians 
in the front line in Donbass. We have more than 1 million IDPs. In Crimea, uh, unfortunately, we see almost every week brutal human rights violation and huge militarization. And Russia, not an actor in Black Sea region, like it was true before. Russia is an aggressor country in Black Sea region, and it's extremely dangerous for not only Black Sea region, but also the region of the Mediterranean. And in this regard, I would like to ask members of the assembly to continue pressure on Russian Federation with purpose to stop aggression, withdraw Russian troops from our territory, and return occupied territories to Ukraine. Thank you very much. I try to be as short as possible, but very, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur, for being mindful of the time. And now I give the floor to Andrei Savitnik, the head of the Belarus delegation. Okay, hello. Uh, do you hear me? Everything is fine. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a very brief. I have a very brief statement referring to uh, the report of uh, Daniel and the reader. Uh, honestly speaking, I'm a little bit disappointed because I see that. Uh, there is a process of consuming unverified, in fact, uh, false information about the situation of the Republic of Belarus. I couldn't imagine what uh, she's talking about, especially about some arrested children. Uh, it is completely, it is completely unfair and illogical and not true, honestly speaking. Uh, in fact, I believe that this information is supplied to her by uh, people who left Belarus and who are benefiting from their status, receiving financial funds from certain uh, Western uh, organizations, uh, which are in fact financing uh, the scenario of colored revolution in the Republic of Belarus. Honestly speaking, if uh, uh, the information will not be critically verified, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, the report uh, uh, will fail to be objective. And uh, honestly speaking, we have to, to be very careful with that because it will compromise the position of uh, the parliamentary assembly as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Savitnik. And now I give the floor to um, Reynaldo Pacta in his capacity as Special Representative of Central Asia. Yeah, dear President, dear Secretary General, dear members, uh, it is an honor for me to have been appointed last December as the President's Special Representative in this key region for the OECE. Uh, you know, I look forward to implementing my mandate to encourage active participation by parliamentarians from the five Central Asian OEC participating states and Mongolia in the work of OEC. For me, this is the most uh, important thing. There's also a written report uh, where you can read uh, more. What I want to mention here is on the one hand, we are observing elections as we did in the Kyrgyz uh, Republic, as we will uh, do in Uzbekistan. On the other hand, we also want to encourage our colleagues from this region to take part, to participate in our election observation missions, which is very important. Uh, there's also a great potential for sharing of experiences in areas like counterterrorism and the reintegration of foreign terrorist fighters. Kazakhstan is seen by the UN here as a role model, uh, so we should uh, use uh, this chance uh, to work together uh, with these countries, because this is an open question in many of our member countries. And I furthermore plan to meet representatives, of course, um, within uh, OEC secretariat and OEC institutions uh, to discuss strategic priorities that we as parliamentary assembly can contribute uh, and uh, support OEC in its work. Um, let me uh, conclude. I look forward to working together with the delegations of Central Asia and Mongolia to further facilitate 
their engagement in the assembly uh, activities. And we should also use the OSCE uh, presence in this region, like the program office in Bishkek. Uh, I am uh, optimistic that we can more involve these uh, five countries and Mongolia in our work as it was possible until today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lopatka, the Reynold, and thank you for being present here. You give us a sense of a little normality with at least one member in the room. Uh, we move on now to the special representative on Arctic issues, Toril. Yes, uh, thank you. I hope that you all can hear me and thank you, uh, Mr. President and also Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues and friends. Times, uh, time does not allow for a full and comprehensive report, of course. So I've uh, placed in the e-folder of the standing committee, my updated work plan, as well as uh, the highlights of the OSCE PA web dialogue. From the Arctic to global, the politi political role in uh, addressing climate change. This document contains uh, some key conclusions and recommendations for uh, our assembly, and it also sums up most of my work. So uh, let me just make three key points. As you know, I uh, continue to give priority in my mandate uh, to the effects of climate change on Arctic uh, societies. And uh, we must still raise awareness that uh, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Climate change is a climate crisis and it directly impacts on people's security. Consequences uh, on Arctic societies should ring the alarm for all of us. And second, as and uh, as MPs, we have some key assets, not least legislative and oversight capacities. And we can also support and provide long-term strategic political leadership to build resilient, sustainable and climate-friendly societies. In particular, it's urgent to adapt national legislation to relevant international agreements, mobilize adequate, adequate resources, engage young people, and work together with all stakeholders. We need to depoliticize the topic and consider joint responses to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and also, and also the climate change. Taking into account all of the above, I call on the PA leadership to explore ways to develop a more structured portfolio on the work on climate within our assembly. It's clear that there's an added value that we can play uh, play on as MPs, we should make use of this. Thank you for the support from the Secretariat and thank you all of you. Thank you very much, Lea Toril, and thank you very much for these uh, very important and uh, forward-looking proposals, which of course we will digest and uh, come back to uh, also in the meeting of the Bureau in the coming days. Um, and now I give the floor to Irene Kararambiris, a special representative on fighting corruption. Irene. Hello, everybody. Long time, no see, I missed you all. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to shortly address uh, today's standing committee meeting. I wish uh, to commend the President and Secretary General for organizing this winter meeting despite the challenging circumstances. I would also like to thank the International Secretariat for their tremendous support in facilitating the web dialogue parliamentarians and journalists partners against corruption 
exploring the critical contrib contribution of journalists and parliamentarians in the global fight against corruption, held on 14th October 2020. Allow me to highlight key takeaways. Uh, I think you've got uh, already on your list uh, uh, the work plan and the implemented activities. So um, I will just uh, highlight key takeaways from this important event. Uh, the first uh, ever with the active contribution of the media, I must say, which I will attempt to transpose into a supplementary item uh, for the next annual uh, session. And Roberto, I count very much on your help in order to succeed in this. The roles of uh, journalists and parliamentarians in the fight against corruption are albeit different, mutually reinforcing, with parliamentarians responsible for creating pertinent anti-corruption legislation and empowering independent institutions and journalists, on the other hand, playing a vital role in fostering transparency and accountability by uncovering malpractices and fighting impunity. Now, strong legal frameworks are essential to provide effective safeguards for freedom of expression and safe working conditions for the media. Ultimate beneficial ownership laws should be adopted throughout the region. Justice systems should be sheltered from undue influence aimed at silencing investigative journalists through restrictive count orders. Journalists, I'm a journalist, that's why I feel so strong about the journalists in general. So journalists should be encouraged to pursue their investigations independently, responsibly, and exclusively in the interest of the public. International organizations such as the OSCE should provide a privileged forum for promoting strategic partnerships among key actors in this field. I would also like to underscore the excellent cooperation with the OSCE executive structures as exemplified for my keynote address at the, uh, web, uh, at the webinar organized by the OSCE Secretariat entitled Open Data in Action, Beneficial Ownership and Public Procurement, marking the International Anti-Corruption Day, uh, which was on the uh, 9th of December 2020. In this view, I warmly welcome the recently adopted uh, Ministerial Council decision uh, preventing and combating corruption uh, through digitalization and increased transparency, which recognizes the vital role played by parliamentarians in fighting corruption, as well as the concrete contribution of our assembly in this domain. I look forward to continuing synergizing with the OSCE Secretariat and the Swedish chairpersonship, of course including by actively contributing to the economic and environmental dimension implementation meeting later this year, which will focus on combating corruption and promoting good governance, as well as by joining forces with the new SR on combating corruption, whom I am eager to meet soon. Hopefully he will give me the chance. Before concluding, let me reiterate that without political will, anti-corruption laws remain empty shells and that the corruption authorities will abandon political will, uh, uh, will feel abandoned, completely abandoned. Political will is therefore the alpha and the omega of any effective anti-corruption strategy. Against this background, I wish to encourage the assembly and all its members to continue to lead uh, by example in this critical field, which greatly undermines both states and citizen security. Thank you so much. Uh, hope it was short. And um, Roberto, the floor is back for, is, is for you. Thank you very much. Thank Shireen. you for your attention.
short and always to the point. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ditmir Bushati, a special representative of UNSAT. Ditmir. Mr. Bushati connected? No. Here. Then the last uh, report is from Ms. Pia Kauma, the special representative of civil society. Dear Mr. Chair and dear colleagues, the past year has been difficult on all of us and it has been especially exceptionally difficult for people working in the field of civil society activism. The energy and dynamism that has always been such a characteristic of non-governmental work doesn't translate well to the confines of a Zoom call. Nonetheless, I have continued to monitor developments in the field and to raise concerns as they have occurred. I have particularly engaged with groups in Kazakhstan and Belarus, where groups have been vocal in raising concerns in recent months. I remain particularly concerned about efforts to pressure, confine or even shut down non-governmental groups through legislation or administrative measures. This has continued in the past year. Long registration procedures, pressure by tax authorities, and demonization through labeling as foreign agents are only some of the efforts to silence critical voices. You will not be surprised to hear that the widespread restrictions on freedom of assembly caused by COVID have also significantly reduced the space for public engagement. This has effectively diminished the voice of many activists, simply adding to the difficulties that they were already facing in many OSCE countries. A year ago at our winter meeting, I hosted a side event focused on the shrinking space for civil society activities. Despite the challenges of COVID, I have worked to maintain dialogue with civil society actors since that time. Unfortunately, I would say that they are even more concerned with their ability to have impact than they were a year ago. It is my hope that in the future, more such events can take place, providing interest groups with an opportunity to raise issues directly with OSCEA members. In the past, I have also taken the opportunity to organize one-on-one -on -one meetings with specific national delegations to encourage interaction with civil society activists attending our meetings. While this is not practical in an online setting, I hope to again make use of this direct diplomatic approach in the future. Colleagues, the vocal engagement by experts and activists is critical to our work as parliamentarians and fundamental to an open and stable society. We should um, be open to hearing from them and would appreciate your support for this effort also in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Thank you Pia, very much. And Mr. President, you want to take it over from here? Uh, thank you very much, Roberto. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto, and thank you for all the contributors uh, and your reports under the, the uh, last item. And once again, I apologize for my coming and going sound-wise. I do apologize. Um, the last item, uh, we haven't very got much time for it, I'm afraid, are the uh, is item 10, reports on preparations for uh, future OSC Parliamentary Assembly meetings. I'm just going to leave the annual session to one side for a moment because uh, delegation from uh, Romania understandably wishes to speak about that. Um, I can do, deal with the rest very quickly. Should uh, health and safety conditions allow us to uh, travel and meet and enter Denmark and get back home again, uh, we hope that uh, the annual bureau meeting on the 18th, 19th, of uh, April uh, this year uh, will go ahead. Um, 
we have an autumn meeting uh, planned in Dublin for the 27th and the 29th of October. Uh, and again, I hope that we're sufficiently far ahead to enable that to go ahead. And we have a bureau meeting and a minister linked with the ministerial council meeting in Stockholm on the 1st to the 3rd of uh, December. Now, if I can just come back to the 29th annual session of Bucharest, uh, which was which was planned for Bucharest on the 6th and 10th of July, as those of you who've been in the meeting will know uh, that our friends and colleagues from Romania have uh, sent a proposal uh, to the uh, Secretariat advising us that because of health and safety in, uh, in uh, Romania, uh, and the difficulties of accommodating a large number of people, they propose that the only physical meeting will be a bureau meeting uh, and the rest to be done virtually. Um, as I have indicated in discussions with uh, our colleague from uh, Romania, there are some difficulties about that, not least of all, and I don't know that I mentioned this, any bureau meeting will just be a meeting of people who are about to go out of office because of the fact that uh, um, they're all due for re-election, apart from uh, Vice President uh, uh, Aze Gulliev. Um, so what I have indicated in conversations with our friends are that uh, I think I can do no more than report to you this is what the uh, Romanian parliament are proposing. I can tell you that we have suggested uh, as a theme um, reinforcing multilateralism in times of global crisis, a parliamentary call for future action. And I think there may have been a suggestion from uh, Romania that they wanted to add something to that. Uh, but more than that, I think we have to say at this stage, uh, being quite honest with everybody, that it's the first time that uh, most of of people he, in this meeting have known about the difficulty and the fact that uh, a full annual meeting would not be possible uh, in Bucharest. And therefore, I think there need to be further conversations between the Secretariat of Romania Parliament and our Secretariat, and a discussion uh, in the light of those conversations uh, with our own Bureau as to what can be done with regard to the annual session, whether, and let's be frank about it, whether this is in Bucharest or, or, or not. Um, uh, and I think that is where we have to leave it today. Now, I'd like to give the floor to uh, the leader of the Romanian delegation who may wish to add, add something to that. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, one uh, one comment only, because I think we um, we talked about this topic at point six. Also, um, I would like to to stress the fact that um, we've been doing the due diligence to identify the the means by which we can uh, uh, make sure that the assembly can be organized uh, in Bucharest as uh, planned, uh, and the uh, the constraints that uh, we encountered in the preparations are not necessarily linked to specific uh, situations in Romania, but to the overall assessment of the situ situation throughout uh, the world and, and Europe. And uh, um, for, for example, the travel constraints are, are uh, linked to the impossibility of some of the delegates from specific countries to, to travel abroad, not uh, for necessarily restrictions in um, in Romania. So that being said, um, I, I think we uh, we are looking forward to uh, understand what would be the alternatives uh, to our proposal and how we would be able to move forward with uh, organizing a successful uh, meeting. Uh, and we believe this format we propose, the hybrid uh, combination of the online activities including voting that uh, we have decided earlier on in, in this meeting uh, with uh, a part which uh, could happen um, in a physical uh, uh, meeting environment uh, i think that that could be a good solution and uh, we expect to uh, to discuss details with the secretary thanks a lot well thank you very much indeed I, and i think you know, it's 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 very generous of you to uh, approach the matter in this way. I really don't think, colleagues, we can take this matter any any further. 
Uh, the most important thing, as I said earlier in the afternoon, is that uh, we will be uh, able to elect new leadership uh, for the Assembly um, and that the Secretariat will be producing uh, and advising us of uh, how that will be done and the systems that will be done. I trust it won't depend on being able to speak over the phone, uh, or the, otherwise that might be a bit difficult for some of us. However, um, I, thank you for, uh, I thank you for your attendance. As I say, we will be able to get our uh, elections carried out. They will be for the full terms, as was indicated in my earlier report, and uh, that will enable the business to carry on. I thank you very much for your attendance. I'm afraid that we have overrun despite the uh, timetable, uh, but uh, it's been a productive meeting, and I look forward to seeing you uh, at the uh, joint uh, session uh, tomorrow. Thank you. I declare the meeting closed.